regular meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee. I will ask that you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I will quickly run through the agenda and then we will get started. We did open um, at six o'clock with an executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the HTA, as well as strategy in preparation for negotiations with non-unit personnel, the superintendent. Um, we will start the meeting with public comments, followed by reports to the school committee. Our first report will be our student council members, and then we'll go right into budget reports. Um, actually, we'll take the superintendent's report out of order, and we'll do that right before the budget reports, um, so we'll get a recap of where we are. Um, under budget reports, we have a report by Dr. Zaleski about literacy professional development program needs, the Hopkins School presentation by Ms. Bellello, the Elmwood School presentation by Ms. Carver, and the Marathon Elementary, for the first time, school um, presentation by Mrs. DeBeau. Uh, Following that, we'll have our liaison reports, we'll have the school committee chair report, and then under new business, we will have a vote on um, aligning the preschool hours with the marathon school. Under old business, we will um, take up the school committee policy EEA for a third reading, and then uh, we will review the final overnight travel request for a trip to the Dominican Republic. Following that, we have our second opportunity for public comment um, and items by consensus, and we're hoping to adjourn by 10.30. So, without further ado, um, our, the first order of business is public comment, so if there's anybody here from the public that would like to comment, please come up. I think since we have our student council in place, we'll have you sit here. Thank you. So we usually ask you to just say your name and give you about three minutes to, sorry about the feedback. Um, and just for people who are listening for the first time, typically don't go back and forth, but absolutely should hear us reflect on your comments when we get to that agenda item on our, on our, um, yeah, on our agenda. Okay. Sure, I'm Meg Tyler and I'm a parent of the <coughs> child in the district. I wanted to speak for a moment on the curricula being offered to students with learning disabilities and special needs in the district. Dyslexia, for example, is the most common learning disability. Up to one in five children have learning disabilities with specific impairments in reading. It is also one of the most well-researched disabilities. The National Institute of Health has determined that 95% of all dyslexic children can be identified by age five and a half, the age of our average kindergartner. Using an appropriate and evidence-based literacy program in kindergarten and first grade can teach all of our children to read, not just dyslexic children. All children will then be able to stay at grade level. They will also need minimal interventions later on and they will need minimal accommodations. Dyslexia cannot be cured, but all dyslexics can be taught to read. In fact, 95% of all children with or without a disability can become proficient readers. Failing to use an appropriate literacy program in kindergarten and first grade is devastating for our children emotionally and educationally. Thinking forward, we will potentially have one in five students identified as dyslexic. We do not have enough teachers trained to contend with these students. We do not have an effective literacy program for students with these reading challenges. The literacy programs we use, foundations and LLI, are not designed to help children with dyslexia or special needs. Foundations, for example, is a great general education curriculum, but it is not great for kids with deficits in phonemic awareness and rapid automatized naming. Research shows definitively that, ex that dyslexia exists at birth. Kids arrive in kindergarten with a neuro neurobiological difference in place. 
When blind children enter kindergarten, we do not wait until the fourth grade to teach them how to read Braille. By the third through fifth grades, dyslexia becomes extremely apparent. If we haven't given them proper literacy programs to teach them to read by the time they reach third grade, they are often two years behind. Once that gap forms, it never closes. Statistics say you can help, but you are never going to close that gap. It's extremely frustrating for parents in the district who have dyslexic children. We don't need to find a cure. We simply need to invest in a proper literacy program for our district. My son is almost nine and cannot read with proficiency. The gap between him and his peers will never close. I will leave you with a few statistics. Every year we test our third graders for our literacy and there will always be a number of them that fail. That statistic, the number of eight-year-olds who fail, is used to determine the number of prison beds we will need in 10 years. That literacy rate is actually our budget projection for prison beds. The Literacy Project Foundation found that three out of five people in U.S. prisons cannot read. Of these, 48% have dyslexia. I would ask all of us to consider what we are going to do for our dyslexic and special needs children in Hopkinton. Will we continue to fail them by letting them fail? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that was here for public comment? No? Okay. Going, going, gone. Um, so we'll move along to our report by our student council. So we have Caroline Murphy and um, Rachel Gooley here <coughs> from the high school. So, Hi, everyone. So to start off, um, we'll talk about sports, which have just started up. And um, our hockey team had one tie and one win. And um, the basketball team has <coughs> had two games. Our track team won yesterday. And our swim team won this week also. And for events, uh, there is a chorus concert tonight at the school. And next Tuesday, there's a One Love Assembly for seniors only, um, which is in memory, sh uh, memory of year Yearly Love, who had passed away due to domestic um, violence in college. So um, that's to get us open for the upcoming season. And on Friday, we're just kicking off the winter break. Thank you very Thank much. You. Any questions? Right. Thank you, girls. Thank you. You're welcome Thanks. to stay if you like. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Didn't think so. Someday, two of them will stay. I have hope. Um, okay, so why don't we move right along? And so we'll take the superintendent's report, the budget overview, out of order, and we'll do that first. Correct? Yeah, we're going to go right. Thank you. Uh, right from my report into the budget presentation overview and I don't see HCAM that it's up here um, even though I turned it on. Oh, it's over here. Look at over that. Here. Oh. Oh. Look at that. Uh, that's wonderful. So do we want to invite Mr. Herr up? Not quite yet. Not yet. I, do, okay. I have some opening comments to make. Sorry. I just okay. wanted to be ready. Sure. Um, but I, I guess in preparing for today and, and really realizing um, and being reminded, as we all were, that today marks uh, five years since the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And the ways in which it's affected all of us in education um, since that day is, uh, is remarkable. Um, the reason I wanted to mention it tonight was because of the tremendous support that we've had over the past four years and continue to have in our budget planning when it comes to safety, security, and social emotional learning. Um, you know, to say that we're ahead of the curve is, is an understatement. Um, but it did, as I was reading and listening to um, reminders and presentations, it made me realize what an impact it had on me in a way that I didn't realize it had uh, through this process. And then I read these words from um, Alan Keller in his message to his teachers, and with his permission, I'll read them today, tonight. Since the shooting at Sandy Hook, I believe, Alan, that we've made some positive changes in our school, 
moved to the ALICE protocol, created a double entry system by installing a second set of doors at the lobby, moved to the main office to the front of the building, allowing for greater visibility and face-to-face -face contact with visitors, launched Crisis Go, began screening grade seven students through signs of suicide, added key fobs for ease of entry into our building for staff, in parentheses, preventing, thus preventing propping of doors, added exterior cameras to all entrances and exits, and will soon be adding a set of doors that lock off the academic area of our school and from the rest of HMS. We've added our start program, brought on the power of we, added a physical activity break, and made some efforts to incorporate more social emotional learning into our day. And I, as I read that, I thought, you know, because we've done this over four years, reading it in a paragraph like this all together really struck me as incredibly powerful in terms of the ways in which this town and the budget that, that the school committee uh, supports and, and makes happen has really put us in a place that I'm very proud of the work around safety and security. Um, and yet, as I, again, reflect on everything that has happened since in five years, the reality is that no matter how much we barricade and how much we make our schools safe, we really need to continue to focus on that social emotional piece. Um, I'm looking at my elementary team and Dr. Zaleski sitting there um, and just thinking about uh, some of the things that you know we deal with or we work with as administrators um, around supporting significant um, social emotional needs. You know at the at the high school the work that happens at, at the high school and the middle school and it needs to continue to be a focus. Um, to assist students who are struggling, your support of the START program is an example, but it goes way beyond that. In fact, as we discussed tonight, our needs for out of district and the in it, tremendous social emotional needs that some of our students have that as a district we can't meet um, are going to continue to need to be priorities. And then I can't um, end without mentioning just gun control and the fact that that topic is something that um, we need to, not we as a school district, but, but our country needs to continue to talk about. So um, that's a really un, unusual start to my report, I, I realize, but I just couldn't, the, t the fact that we were meeting tonight and tonight is the anniversary, I just couldn't let that opportunity pass us by. So thank you for listening. Um, and it's hard to jump into anything less, less critical than that. So I think I, I'll leave those comments as my report, and then we can jump into um, the, the budget overview. I may have to stand up because um, I'm realizing that as we, we go through this, and I, I'm fine standing up anyway. We could now, though, Jean, invite our guests. Okay. All of our guests, our elementary principals and our... Our uh, Brian is here. Yeah, and Rebecca. So I think, did you want the elementary principals at yes. the yellow table? <laughs> and uh, Brian and Rebecca at the you gray table? Right. Yeah, we'll start with, with Brian oh. and Rebecca, and then we'll invite you up. Thank you. Because, uh, Dr. Zaleski, you're going to sit right there, and Dr. Zaleski's going to go after my report. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever she says, just do that. <laughs> so, I know. It is true, but we're being flexible tonight because we're at each camp, and, and so um, you can look that way or this way. I just uh, need to be a little bit closer to the screen. So we're starting with a, a, a quick overview. I'm not going to go into details, but um, this is where we were on November the 2nd. And, okay. and this is where we were on November the 2nd by separating out um, special education costs, and you can see that 6.9% was still a very long way away from where we wanted to be working towards 4%, um, which is what we had been, we had agreed to with the budget me message to work towards. This is why I knew I had to get closer. So uh, um, these are the reductions. So you can see since November the 2nd and where we were when we left that meeting, 
the reductions that are being called out here, and I won't go into great detail because you've heard the details that are, are associated with them, but it included reductions at the middle school of three full-time positions. It included a reduction of a, of a full-time position in technology, um, a reduction of a 0.6 position at the high school, the details of which we've discussed um, already. Um, it, it included a change in um, the, I won't talk about that one because the center school, uh, we're gonna talk about tonight, uh, 1.0 reduction, uh, something that, that Lauren will talk about that had to do with, with projected class size. Um, this brought us to, from 8.9 to 7.8% overall increase. And again, if we take out our special education out of district costs, a 5.8% in, uh, increase overall for the budget. This piece here is calling out the athletics. Look, again, that we've talked about it over a couple of meetings that if we were to charge um, an athletic use, it would reduce the budget even more so to get us down to 5.5%. An increase that we know is still far a long way away from where we set out to try to get to. But tonight, what I'd like to quickly talk about with um, um, Sue's help is what the drivers are. So here's the overview. Again, what I just separated, discussed, getting us to where we are. This is without the athletics. Um, this is significant. We're looking at over the past several years, we've been at 82% payroll and um, 18% expense, and you can see that the 80-20 split is the same split comparing personnel and expense that it's been throughout our discussions. And that's why when we talk about these drivers, um, we have some really significant changes this year, or challenges. One is that we're opening a new school. A second one is around a new transportation contract. A third challenge has to do with the out-of-district um, expenses. And then the fourth one, which is what we really want to be reinforcing tonight because it's one that we haven't reinforced enough, is this piece around enrollment. So if we began at 3.3% um, increase before we did anything, um, and then, sorry, this is where I wanted to be. Here's where we began. Before we even started our work on our budget, just with status quo, keeping all of our programs intact and not reducing anything, we were already at 3.3% of an increase. With the reductions that I just outlined um, around personnel and, well, basically the personnel reductions, it, we got down to, this was before our increases, just with the work that we did to reduce, we got down to 1.7%. And I wanted to stress that as an overview through this process because I think when we take small pieces of the budget to get really drilled down and it's really important part of our work together, sometimes it's easy to lose the overall, the work that happened through the work of all of us in, the, in this room um, got us to that place before we started to make the increases that were a reduction. All of these increases on this slide are because of that enrollment the increase that we've been talking about that we knew that was uh, that we knew was coming, we've been managing. And I've talked about the reasons we could manage was because, you know what, if I have 12 classrooms and I have 24 kids, all right, I've got room, I can spread them out across 12 classrooms, and now we've got class size 25, and that's not wonderful, but if that's the difference between, I know I'm looking again at Vanessa and at Anne, and at Lauren and all three of these principles, we're, we're dealing with significant challenges as they began to, as they went to open their buildings this year, all three of them. So they may do, but it's in front of us now. And we know that as we're planning for optimal, not even optimal class size, class size that will allow us to continue to provide the excellence of programming that we provide and that we're proud of being able to provide we need to have increases um, of elementary school teachers, elementary teachers, seven in total, four at Marathon, two at Elmwood, and one at the Hopkins School. Those are all additions. 
a point a point four secondary teaching position at the middle school. Um, what was that for, Sue? So the middle school oh, right, is right, right, right. That was a trade. Right. It's okay. a yeah. It's a program trade. So you see it actually on the decrease and on the increase. So it's a shift of decreasing of Spanish and an increase of Mandarin. Yeah. So. So that one technically is, a wash. It's not. It's not directly related to enrollment increase. Right. But that is. We're calling this out on both slides. Um, the 1.4 increase at the Hopkins. At the 0.4 increase of the math coach. Um, Vanessa will just be discussing that when she comes up tonight. Uh, the adjustment counselor, you've already you already know about the 1.0, and um, Anne will be talking about the need for the adjustment counselor. To my earlier opening comments at the um, at the Elmwood School, custodian enrollment, new building size goes without saying. The L teachers, you've heard about that since September or before from Dr. Kavanaugh. That is enrollment directly enrollment increase. Um, SPED coach at the grades two through five level, um, partly to address the things that were brought to our attention tonight. Um, and the uh, support personnel, as, with, as I've described before, when we increase enrollment, we also have to increase the supports that happen through the classroom, whether it be through specialists, all of the specialists that service kids cannot be within their um, within their caseload, they can only take on so many students. So as we increase enrollment and we think about increasing teachers, classroom teachers, that means increasing specialists as well. Um, that got us back up to 4.4%. But these two slides I think are really important to consider together because we started at a place and first we made reductions. First we said, where can we cut back? What are things, and you've heard me say this every single year, before we bring on something new, what is it that we were doing that we're going to be doing differently, and how does that affect our budget? Um, the expense changes I've already mentioned, and you've heard about them each um, each time that we've met. And the uh, this is the follow-up questions from the middle school from last meeting. You asked, and Alan um, provided the responses to how many, what, what has the summer enrollment looked like over time? And the questions that came around middle school came because there was concern voiced by teachers at our meeting that night, and there were concerns based uh, from, sub, from all of you, actually, is how can you be, when you have all of this enrollment and you're talking to me about enrollment, how can we be reducing teachers? And what we want to be able to explain tonight is that we're looking at pre-K through 12, and we have an increase of 10 teachers in our budget. We've got to be able to look realistically across the district to understand what our class size looks like across the district. And you can see that the increases in the summer at the middle school have been not only consistent but minimal. Um, the actual NES, the actuals and the NESDEC projections have been really close. That was another question that, that came as a result of last, our meeting two weeks ago. And the district class size, and I'm really sorry that there's so much in it, it's hard for you to see this, but the point that we were trying to make in this slide is if you look at grade seven and eight, this is the actual in the middle. These projected numbers, 20 and 23, includes the reduction. So these projected numbers are including the recommendations that you've heard and the recommendations that you'll hear tonight. This includes the numbers in each of the elementary buildings, the increases that are being requested, um, and it includes um, Lauren's reduction on one of her kindergarten teachers. So that you can see that the numbers, we're delighted with these numbers. We're delighted that we're finally, finally recommending class size K-8 um, that can really meet that goal that the school committee has set up out for themselves as part of your strategic plan to, to, for optimal class size. Um, and as the, as, as especially Alan, because he, elementary hasn't been here yet, um, reminded you is that this is the average. As soon as we start moving some students into keeping us one class smaller, it's gonna of course increase class size in some of the other classrooms. Um, 
the other thing to keep in mind is as we think about these numbers, this is projected, right? This slide shows you that since the beginning of, since September 1, and this was last week when I got the numbers, we've had 57 students enroll, 57 students. So where we are and what our projections are, it is a roll at revolving door and I'm hearing from the principals on an ongoing basis in terms of the numbers of students that are arriving on their doorsteps daily. So when we build these class sizes, we need to make sure that we leave room for all of those additional enrollments and students that are coming. You know, our NESDEC, our NESDEC projections take us to October 1. Dr. McLeod, I'm finding it very hard to read from here. Is I, there I something apologize. we can, is, um, are there any printouts or um, something else? Because some of the slides are really hard. Yeah, I know. I apologize. That's why I'm standing here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not print them out because I'm conserving paper. But I will get it posted online, okay. Nina, and I will definitely make sure that all of you get a follow-up. Um, I'm trying to summarize as I go. Um, yeah, I know it's difficult. It's not optimal for sure. Um, the enrollment changes since this was another question that we had. Uh, we're really looking oh, for this one. So other than the fact that you can't see the slides, and um, I suppose what I could do, although we can't even we can't even share it electronically, um, I think what would be good would be to pause hear from um, Dr. Zaleski and the elementary principals mm -hmm. tonight. But I wanted to kind of give you that background and have you understand that as you hear from them, these numbers and the budget drivers and where we are, which is at 5.5 overall, um, we're really looking tonight, in, in addition to hearing from all of our wonderful guests, um, we're looking for direction on, in terms of you know, where we are right now and where we could possibly continue to go in our budget, in your budget, um, to find additional reductions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask, could you go leave it on the aggregate where are we now slide? Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful just to have up there as we talk tonight. Not that one, but... Uh, Probably no. Keep go for it, Ann. Uh, whatever the the summary of where we are tonight. Yeah. It wasn't big enough for that. That one. I think no, it's I, this one, John. Here. That one. That's the one I want. Yep. Fourteen. This is. Do you want it with or without separating out? I'd rather have it with. I think. Uh. I know, but they're there. <laughs> you got it. She found some money, I don't know about yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Zaleski, we would like to come up. Okay. All right, great. So, um, yes, yeah, so Dr. Zaleski, if you're ready, we have room for you at the yellow table. Um, I'll make an That's okay. So, I will ask Dr. McLeod to introduce us to the conversation and then turn it over to you, so go right ahead. So thank you, Dr. Seleski, for being here tonight and um, just wanted to remind the school committee that the reason I asked you to come back um, as part of the budget process is that, you know, given, given the ongoing work that happens and given the fact that this is a, a living budget, you know, it, the chapter is not closed just because some, we have taken something up and something that happens one, at one meeting can affect what might happen at another. And as a result, um, there was discussion at your meeting that really impacted not only special education programming, but programs across the district uh, for struggling learners. Mm -hmm. And so um, I asked you to come back. I know that you've met with, um, with members of the team, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. So after our last budget presentation, and part of the ongoing work that I'm doing in the district is analyzing the need for um, how to address the gap, really, with student literacy, with both general education and special education, because part of addressing that work is we have to have that healthy collaboration between the two groups, um, which is preventative. As we heard from concerned parents tonight, there's a great concern about how we're addressing literacy in our district. 
Um, and that extends not just for special education students, but also for general education students. So with that, part of my data analysis and looking at um, student needs, is particularly at the elementary level, I called a meeting together on November 29th of the literacy experts in the district, meaning reading specialists, building-based prince, elementary principals, um, as well as central office leaders, and that included Dr. Kavanaugh and Dr. McLeod. And we, we looked at the need when I addressed my presentation, and we discussed what we can best do, both general education and special education together, to provide as much support as possible so we can be really proactive in our approach to providing student service delivery for, again, gen ed and special education. So as I identified in my last budget presentation, I'm requesting a liter uh, coach for grades two to five special education. And it is my hope that that position will allow an expert to come in and analyze specialized programming for students in the area of special education and how to address those specific specialized individual needs and provide a resource to us to help us um, make some really good decisions about how we're addressing the parent concerns. With that, I also received input from the general education folks that I just mentioned. And we made this determination. I know I sent you folks this list, and I'll just kind of highlight it for those who are watching on TV. But <coughs> when we analyzed our current practices, in addition to the coach position to assist in the area of special education, we identified that there needs to be a lot of staff training. So one of the training areas of need is in the area of Wilson reading. Um, Wilson offers a compass plan approach where educators are, have the opportunity to be uh, specifically and directly professionally developed by this organization in this particular area to provide targeted instruction across the grade spans, elementary grade spans. In addition, and that would be primarily through um, the Elmwood in the center schools. When um, we did a further deeper dive in terms of what the needs are at the Hopkins School, we identified just words as critical along with um, including WRS introductory workshops, which really is a Wilson reading system approach. And um, again, this is to assist in proactively identifying what the reading needs are, both general education and special education. Um, we realized in district, we have a, a couple of certified Wilson trained folks right now in district. The dilemma is, is they're not hired specifically to, to just provide that direct instruction on an ongoing, everyday basis. They're, one of them is a team chair, for instance, and her role is a lot of case management. So although she has the opportunity to provide some level of instruction through maybe stipends and grants when we have the opportunity, that's not her primary role. So we identified, given that we know we have a growing need in the area of liter literacy, it would be wise to train two teachers at one at Elmwood's and one at Hopkins School, specific for that purpose, trained in Wilson instruction to provide that delivery of service throughout the day to students in need, and they can group them accordingly based on data and how they assess the need as we get going. Um, and then finally, LLI training, actually second to finally, I realized there's one more point, LLI training is leveled literacy intervention, which would be uh, a level of intervention provided for both Center, Elmwood, and Hopkins. So level literacy intervention has different level, levels, and they categorize it by color coding, red, blue, depending on the level that you're at. Um, we've already done some work with purchasing some supplies and kits to provide that resource, but really we need to offer some more intervention and material and resource training around that approach um, for general education students. And special education students have access to this as well in, in whatever intervention they're in to per their you know, individualized planning needs. The final piece, is we've identified that fund foundations training and implementation is uh, lacking for grade three. So we've had some training for um, grades two and under, but for grades three, we are lacking in that area. So the overall presentation that I'm offering you tonight does come with a cost. And um, we did an estimate when we looked at um, you know, the different organizations and what they offer for training and how many people we may need to train um, for all of these different things. We estimated around 10,000 per building. So for the three elementary buildings, that's a $30,000 cost, in addition to a $20,000 cost for the foundations. You know, part of this strategy is to provide, again, a proactive approach to reading. And our thinking when we met as a, as a team 
with all the experts in the room, is that if we can provide this blended approach to literacy at these grade levels, particularly with the general education population, perhaps we can prevent students from having that gap and maybe needing further special education down the road. So uh, we're hopeful that, again, by providing these services at this grade level and providing the necessary training to staff, we'll be able to really have a lot of, um, you know, access to a lot more expertise in the buildings and availability of having trained staff on site to provide directed service. So with that, I'd love to hear your questions, <laughs> thoughts. Okay, does anybody have questions or did you want to add anything before we, okay. Does anybody have questions? <clears throat> I do have questions. Okay. Um, so this amount that you're requesting, mm -hmm. uh, where would this be? What would be the source of it? Is it from the which general pool? budget? It is from the general budget. From the general right. budget. Right. It's not specific. To it wasn't. Special. It wasn't I included in the slide that you could not see. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it would be in addition to where we're already at with the budget, Mina, and we we'd need to find a place that we could reduce in order to be able to mm -hmm. add it. I see. And is this a one-time uh, training that you're looking at, or is it something that you see as recurring? Um, right for right now, it's definitely a one-time. Uh, you know, the unpredictability with that question is if folks left. So if we trained folks and they left, and we hired new staff, let's say next year, um, you'd hope that there is sustainability and we want staff to stay. But if we trained folks and let's say we had a Wilson person leave or take another position, which is for instance, Ms. Callahan, who's now in a team chair role. She wasn't always in a team chair role. She was in an educational special ed teacher role. Um, and she had that specific training when she took a different role. We lost that direct support on an ongoing basis. So for now, this is definitely a one-time request because I feel like with the volume of training we're going to be able to offer, we'll have enough in-district providers. But I don't want to say that as a matter of fact, in case somebody leaves or we need more direct service at a building a year or two from now. Um, so that's that's the reality, just of you know, if staff turnover. But we hope that doesn't happen. Um, and one other question was the comments that we received from CPAC mm -hmm. and the concerned parents. Yes. And if you have had a chance to have that conversation, I know we received an email earlier mm -hmm. as well. Have you had a chance? I, I'm sure you have put in so much thought mm -hmm. before you came up with this sure. proposal. Yes. But when we hear these concerns from parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel it's important that that conversation has happened, and I know you work very closely right. with the CPAC team. Yes. If you can share some thoughts around that. Yes, I can share some thoughts. So we've talked as a CPAC group as a whole. We had Dr. Kavanaugh come and do a presentation to CPAC um, regarding the MCAS and the data, and she has agreed to come back and speak to CPAC specifically about some other concerns they have relating to um, gaps. <coughs> Am I correct in that, Dr. Kavanaugh? Is that your understanding? Um, it's specific to the concerns that they bring regarding um, practices to special education and, and the uh, reading approaches to special education, that is unrelated specifically to this request. This request is to remediate the gap for both general education and special education, providing a proactive approach. Whereas, um, if I'm understanding the parent concerns tonight, and again, I haven't I haven't had a chance to have a conversation since the email that we received because sure. we just received it last night. Um, but that request and the way it, it is proposed um, seems like it's a concern regarding specific to special education students. What specialized instruction are we providing for those students? It is my hope through this reading coach position as well as the proactive approach that we're going to utilize with the general education students through these blended approaches that we'll be able to collectively continue to work with the special education parents on what makes sense moving forward um, in addition to what we're currently doing. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Other questions? So I just have one question. So looking at this um, this fifty thousand dollar investment, so mm -hmm. year two, three down the road, how do we measure the success or lack thereof of this of of what you're proposing? We would measure it based on the student data. It would be a, a, when we look at student data, we triangulate our data. So we look at you know the standardized results, MCAS results. We also look at unit-based assessment as well as individual portfolio data. Um, students with special needs would look at other things, MCAS alt data if we had that data. So um, through the varying data points that teachers collect on an ongoing progress monitoring basis, that's how we would measure in the special education world. So that was just kind of a general education mm -hmm. um, description. And if Carol or anybody has anything else to add, uh, 
because they work more closely with that population. In the area of special education, our progress reports and our progress monitoring um, tools that we utilize would help us inform the progress reports and that would give me the data that I need to determine whether or not <coughs> students are meeting grade level benchmarks um, per their IEP. I am sure that our elementary principals, Mr. Graziano, are going to have a lot to say about this as okay. well when they when they um, join us. Okay. But summing it up for mm -hmm. yeah. me, it's not as close to this yes. stuff. So you're, you're talking about the student growth data and the benchmarking data that we use is what's going to tell us whether or not this is having an impact. It'll be student growth growth data, benchmarking data, and Carol, if I'm missing anything from the gen ed side, as well as unit-based assessment data, and then the IEP data as well will help inform. Am I missing anything? No, I think that we do BAS testing all the time. So there's benchmarking. We have star reading, which will do progress monitoring, and it will tell us um, about growth percentile scores, so individual students' growth. At Hopkins, they have QRI data. So there's just that SRSD data. So there is that ongoing data that we look at. Um, we have a lot of watch lists. And so mm -hmm. they are there, and, and we do have a good sense of whether or not what we're trying is working. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nancy, do you have questions? Not right now. No. I do have um, a couple of questions. So thank you for the update. And um, I just want to make sure I'm clear in my own brain about what we are and are not addressing through this proposal. So this is really sort of a follow-on to the presentation that you made to us earlier, um, and this additional request um, in combination with the coach is really targeted more towards the Tier 1, Tier 2 interventions. Tier 1, 2, and 3. And 3, okay, mm -hmm. but the, the specific um, challenges that we heard earlier are more related to Tier 3 interventions and so the coach is going to help with that but mm -hmm. I, there's an ongoing conversation I assume about other uh, what other needs there are in that regard mm -hmm. and that's part of the work that you've been doing is that I'm just trying to piece together all of the different mm -hmm. meetings and conversations mm -hmm. that have been happening mm -hmm. so this isn't necessarily an indirect response to the to the concerns that were just brought forward no, no it's not indirect I just response. Make, okay so I just want to mm -hmm. make sure that we're all on the same page that we are hearing those concerns and they, they may be addressed differently, but it isn't our expectation that that's going to be addressed through what right. we're doing here, which doesn't mean that this isn't something that we need to do. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And right. there's some overlap, as you had mentioned, with the special education coach and the reading coach, the grade two to five coach, to assist in the areas of some of the concerns that the parents um, brought forward regarding analyzing specialized instruction for those students. Okay. And then, as you said, you just got this information and you'll continue that conversation as well. And we may be hearing from you in the future. <laughs> yeah. Always happy to come back. Okay. All right. And Jean, if yes. I can just add, um, this type of program, this year we actually lost a grant, um, which could have covered a significant okay. portion mm -hmm. of this program. And then year two, being 2019, could have covered the rest of it, potentially. So it's just uh, you know something to bring about to the uh, committee so that you understand we're putting this into our operating budget, but it also is a direct response to losing a grant opportunity that we've had for a number of years. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and well, that's, that's a good point. Now. Thank you. Yep. And what was the reason we lost the grant? They just changed um, who and how the grant was being targeted, and so it put Hopkinton out. Um, I have one other question. Sure. When are you looking for this? Um, uh, training to happen uh, for next year it'll be for next year okay. we did we um, made some phone calls and we were trying to work with Wilson folks to see if there's a way we could find funds for this year uh, the trainings are full you have to have students identified and the cohorts identified in addition to the loss of funding we weren't able to do it for this year so um, if the budget gets approved we'll automatically um, begin working on this um, even before we're able to expend the funds to maybe reserve slots with folks and contracted providers to provide this training for our, our staff so that they, this would potentially benefit some students next year, not just the trainings over the course of the year, or would it actually benefit students next year? 
Oh, it'll definitely benefit the students, uh, absolutely. Uh, usually what they do, and in, in, um, you know, Carol, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but with some of the general education, the, the, the training folks, when they come in on LLI and they do training on Wilson, um, you have to have cohorts of students identified to begin immediately working so they can oversee and they, they provide uh, information and analysis. Uh, sometimes you have to go off site, sometimes they come on site, depends on what model we sign up for. Um, but that is my understanding. Is that your understanding as well? So for things like LLI training, that's offered more frequently than something like Wilson. Wilson is pretty difficult to arrange. Mm -hmm. um, so we have sent folks in the summertime to Leslie University to do the LLI training and then they come back and they're ready to hit the ground running when school starts, but I don't think that that would be the case with Wilson. Mm -hmm. okay. I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Anything else? Gene, um, I was just wondering, it's, uh, are we going to take a vote on this at this point? No, 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 okay, this is all great. part of our budget presentation. So that, this isn't for the FY18 budget, this is going for the in. 19. Okay, yeah. so it'll get added on there. Exactly, okay. yes, so no. To the invisible overview. Yes, <laughs> you can't see the number because it's so yeah. tiny. Okay, um, well thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and do we want to have all, all three? three? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if all three of our elementary principals would mm -hmm. like to come you. up, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you. Thank Dr. you, Dr. Dr. Zolinski. Zolinski. Um, Hello? Oh, and I didn't add, I'm sorry, I didn't look at Did you guys have questions? I just let it go. I'm so sorry. Rebecca, did I just let her go when you had questions and I totally forgot you guys. Okay. I can probably answer. I think you can. I know you said that you weren't going to add that as an additional cost. We're going to find other customers. That's what we said, yeah. That is what we're going to do. Um, we just really feel it's a priority and we did not want to, you know, after listening to Dr. Zaleski during her presentation, um, you know, the ongoing nature of our work, it just felt like we should not let this opportunity, we shouldn't miss it. So we will definitely work together um, to find a place where we can continue to reduce so that we can, we can bring this on, if approved. Welcome. The highlight of the budget season <laughs> is just okay. arrived at the table. She um, says that every week. I know. <laughs> she already said that. <laughs> I did not. I did not. Um, kind of different this year because the past couple of years we've had all five of you and that's also been really wonderful. But I think we did see them recently enough that, you know, it's always so compelling to hear the connection, you know, between from Lauren all the way up to Evan, or we could say from Evan all the way up to Lauren, maybe, <laughs> is, is how we could say it. But, um, but thank you for being here. I know that you've provided you know, your detailed um, overviews, and, and there's been so much work that you've been back and forth and hours and hours and hours of time with Central Office to get us to where we are tonight. Um, I believe that you are prepared for Vanessa to begin um, with her overview. So I think if that's okay with you, sure, we'll turn it over to Vanessa. Okay. As a middle child, I never get to go first. Ah. So, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. You. Um, so I think what I want to start with, because it's quick, um, the expense summary. I know that you had a chance to look at our executive summaries, and as you could see, we really were looking to make it as level funded as possible. Um, the Chromebooks did a great job at helping us look at reducing paper costs, um, doing a lot less photocopying, and we are seeing that already in our school year. One of the things that I really took to heart was hearing from some of you about the desire to take some of the things off of our summer supply list. Um, and so one of the reasons for a slight increase of a couple thousand dollars, we did the analysis to look at taking those gigantic summer supply lists that families get and looking at us, um, looking at the supply costs of a school taking that on and markers buying on bulk and how that helps out and school provi providing some of those things that have gone into there. So um, that is where there is a slight increase. We know that we have you know the, the expectation or the request for a, a 24th classroom. So we are going up in a classroom. 
but the reality is the number of students is not that different. Um, so overall expenses, we've kept it very similar to last year. We also know that with Center School leaving us and going to Marathon, both Ann and I plan to repurpose and use Recycle, upcycle, um, some of that furniture. <laughs> we scavenge <laughs> off of what's at center school for some of the things that we every year come to you about. Kidney tables and ta tables versus desks are very popular right now. And um, teachers really like using those in the classroom. So those kinds of things that they have, we will be taking. So some of those areas have gone down. But as I mentioned, um, so we're really looking at very similar projections in overall numbers, but we are requesting one additional classroom. Right now, even since you got my budget summary, we've added seven new students at Hopkins School um, in a week and a half. And so we are um, over 24 students. Um, we have two, fifth grade, two fourth grade classrooms with 25 students at this point. And I can tell you that 25 is too high in my opinion. Uh, 24 is pretty high particularly since we are so committed to the workshop model, we believe in that strongly for both literacy instruction and for mathematics. We know that the workshop model allows our teachers to differentiate in a much better way, um, guided reading instruction, and when you're talking about 25 kids, it gets very hard to do the um, optimal size guided reading instruction, and same with math, which we'll get to in a minute. So we are requesting an additional classroom, which will allow us to be closer to um, 22.5, about 22.6 students per classroom, which I think is a reasonable number. Obviously, we'd always like to go lower, but 22 to 23, we can manage at the upper elementary levels and know that we can continue to provide the workshop model. Um, the other additional request that I've had, and, and I've thought a lot about this my four years in Hopkins School, looking at our overall instructional model, we have moved in literacy to a coaching model. Last year we did a lot of the work bringing in the professional development. We've talked over the last two or three years about SRSD and bringing in outside support to help us through that implementation process. You've heard from Lauren and from Ann and myself about how <coughs> successful and how wonderful we see that developing our students' writing. We're starting to see the payoffs. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and I were just talking about that today, some encouraging information that Dr. Leslie Lodge shared with Carol um, about some of those results that are coming out in our areas of writing. That's wonderful to see. In reading, we've implemented the coaching model. So instead of having a full-time reading, re reading teacher, remedial reading teacher at Hopkins, that role has changed. We talked about this as part of our school improvement plan process. If you will remember, I shared how we were looking for a combined model so that our, our reading specialist coach does do some work with intervention groups providing LOI instruction. But the really exciting thing, and I hear weekly, daily from Hopkins teachers, is how excited they are about the coaching model. Hopkinton is a small district. Um, they have worked very hard at central office to keep the size of our overhead as far as specialists or curriculum directors small in order to make sure we're balancing small class size. Um, we recognize we value keeping our classroom teachers on the front line. But our classroom teachers are asking us all the time for coaching, for support in their role. At the elementary level, we have generalists. Um, they like being generalists. They want to teach literacy. They want to teach mathematics. They enjoy working with their classrooms. They, they value the social-emotional connection they make with their classes, and they want to maintain that. But in order to do so, when I look at our MCAS results, particularly in the area of mathematics, we know that the area we continue to struggle in is constructed response. That's incredibly challenging to teach and understand how to analyze multi-step math problems, especially as you get to fourth and fifth grade. And our teachers really will benefit from a similar kind of coaching model that we've implemented with literacy. The coach goes in, she collaborates with the teacher, she's modeling for the classroom teacher, she's talking about student learning, what they need, Sometimes the classroom teacher is doing the instruction and then they sit and talk afterwards. They look at groupings of students. So the coaching model has become so powerful in literacy, we really feel that that's what we need to boost up our math instruction. 
So you may say, why 0.4? Well, obviously, earlier in the process, I'd love to have more. But knowing that I could have a day a week devoted to a person working with my fourth grade math teachers to model those lessons, to talk to them about how to implement new um, assessments, common assessments, instructional methods, and then a day for fifth grade, that's where I see that. We, we don't have a curriculum director dedicated to elementary math. Um, we don't have a math specialist. And to me, the, the coaching model is so valuable because you develop a relationship with that person. There's a trust that you can ask them questions about your practice. When I look at our MCAS scores over the last couple of years, and I see us stuck at only three quarters of our students at Hopkins making proficiency in mathematics, and that's been a trend going back in time, that's not good enough for Hopkins, and that's not good enough for Hopkinton. And to me, this coaching position will help push that, because we're not talking about just interventions anymore. We're talking about general classroom instruction in mathematics for all of our students. So we get a lot more than 75% of our students to proficiency. And I think that this is what we need to do that. Thank That's you. it for my presentation. <laughs> um, I would be happy to take your questions. So that pretty much covers where my increases were this year. Okay. Does somebody want to start off with questions? I don't have any questions so much as I, I think that, I mean, the, the effort that you put into trying to keep this as level as possible is very admirable. I mean, you guys, I'm sure all three of you, but I'll start with you, Vanessa, yeah, <laughs> that you put in a tremendous amount of effort to do that, and I think you do a really good job of justifying your requests. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have a question, because I feel like you did a good job justifying your requests. So I think I got this from the executive summary, but I just want to clarify. So the additional classroom, the only expense increase associated with it is the teacher yes I'm not asking for anything else and you're net offsetting that well right? so I'm an increase of well no the, the 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 decreases are in other areas but I am a 1.0 increase in classroom teachers going in classroom in classroom sections, teachers but yes. in terms of overall heads it's Right. Yes. As okay. of right now. Now, I mean, we did see a huge spike. Fourth right. grade has been incredible. I think we're now 26 or 27 above the NASDAQ projections at, 20, at fourth grade this year, which is why we're sitting at 25 in some classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not in any way suggesting I think it, it, it has to be. I, I think the, addition, you, the argument for the additional classroom teacher, I think, right. is, and very, that's is very I well said, made. As far so as with expenses, section, it's yep. really the same yep. size school next year mm -hmm. is what we're projected to have yep. is what we have sitting that right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all I just wanted to clarify. Thank yeah. you. I do, but where did you get the, they got sent out, but you can look on mine. Um, <laughs> Nina, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited you're asking for what you need. And I'm wondering, what is the maximum class size? You mean, what would I be comfortable with? Uh, I guess you've shared the average, right? right? What do you think would be the maximum, would you know? Well, so right now I'm projecting that I would add a section at fifth grade. So we would have 12 sections of fourth and 12 sections of fifth. That would put next year's <coughs> fifth grade at just over 22 students per classroom. Um, at, I've, yeah, fifth grade at just over 22 and fourth grade a little bit higher. I mean, it's percentage points, but as with where we're projections right now, we would be sitting at between 22 and 23 in each classroom at Hopkins if the projections are correct. And you're comfortable with just that one, given that you just had seven children enrolled? We actually went back and forth a lot, and we talked about this. And if I needed to do class sizes of 24 again, if we were to go up another 24 students above projections, we 24 I can make work. 25 is there's that, there's a lot of bodies in one room, and it's it's very challenging for those of you who know about guided reading and how important it is to keep the number of levels that you're working with at a time very close together. Um, in thinking about this and seeing already the payoff in teachers just raving about this coaching model. It's really working. Teachers build, it builds their, their faith, their trust that they have a partner alongside them. We've talked for years 
about co-teaching and how valuable it is and how you learn from having somebody else watching you teach or watching somebody else teach. It's one of the best things about being an administrator is going in, I feel like I'd be a much better classroom teacher today than I was when I was in a classroom because of the number of rooms I go in. You just see so much. And our coach has been a classroom teacher and she's been a learning specialist, she's been a reading teacher. So she brings with her all of that wealth of information but also the knowledge how to collaborate and that's the key. You build a relationship, a rapport with the teachers so they feel comfortable saying, I have no, I, I'm just not comfortable with the way I'm delivering distributive property or teaching the area model. Our teachers understand now after all of these years since 2011 about the math frameworks. They're very comfortable. I sat in a PLC today and the fifth grade teachers were sharing, you know, th these, are the, these are the areas that we're really struggling with. The kids aren't doing great, but they want some more help in, okay, what is a better way to deliver that instruction? It's not about a textbook. It's not about a teacher le reading the script. It's about that art and science of teaching that comes together. So it's great that you can have a script or a scripted math program, but that's not how we meet the needs of all the students in our room. You might start with a script or a book, but it's the teacher sitting there analyzing what is the student learning that's happening and how do I improve the rate of that. And that, to me, doesn't happen in isolation. We need a coach, we need collaboration, we need strong PLCs. I feel like we're making good progress with our PLCs at Hopkins, having great conversation. We need some coaching for our teachers so that they can feel confident that they're meeting all of those needs in a workshop model. I have one other question. I know Dr. Cavanaugh had sent a very exciting survey a couple of weeks ago related to STEAM and asking the community to participate and um, look to ways in how we can involve the community members in you know, conducting maybe some classroom help or sessions or workshops or what have you. Uh, is there something, some connection between the two? We've been working with the HBTA and half on um, some science nights at Hopkins and bringing in resources. The new science standards are really exciting to work with, but there's a high level of need for inquiry labs and engagement that way. So to me, science is a fabulous place for us to really look to our community to help. Um, not just on a science night, but also coming in to help out and support during an inquiry lab. We have that wonderful science lab space now at Hopkins, which we are utilizing. I love going in there and seeing students use it, that space. Mathematics is challenging, you know, and new reports come out all of the time about, you know, which programs, but as I said, I don't think it's about the program. We know what we have to teach. We have to figure out the best way to deliver that to the students sitting in front of us, and that might differ a little bit um, from child to child, right? Um, but as you hear community members, if you, as you hear parents talking about, oh, that new math. Well, it's not really new math. The math is the same. But the expectations on our students to think and deeply and analyze what they're doing. I think um, Dr. Kavanaugh, I recall putting up during the MCAS presentation a fourth grade MCAS question. And the level of complexity, the four step problems, and this is what I was talking about analyzing, this is where we are struggling with in Hopkins and Hopkinton in general, actually, if you look across the grade levels, but specifically at our level, the students at fourth grade, nine year olds, what they're expected to do to break about a part of problem and go through multiple steps and do a big constructed response in mathematics is not like the kinds of mathematical problems that we do. We do really well with computation. It's much harder to teach that deep level of thinking. So again, yes, uh, and, I, and I do hope that you, know, you will look to the community members Absolutely. also to help out with some of the programs that you're laying out. And um, again, I uh, want to say this again, I'm very excited you're asking for what you want. Mm -hmm. And I also saw in your summary that you are looking to utilize HEF and HPTA, which you just mentioned those funds. I think it's great. Thank you. And I would say it's not what I think I want. I think it's what our students in Hopkinton need, yeah. and our Hopkins students in particular. So I just put my plug in one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us tonight.
I do have a couple of questions, sure. and it's not because I don't think you did an excellent job, but I <laughs> do. Uh, that's my nature. Yeah. Um, so I was going to, and this is a spoiler alert for all who are coming next, um, ask the impact of not adding the teacher because I feel it's responsible because mm -hmm. of the budget situation that we're in, but having heard what you just described, about how, what the class sizes are already and how far you're over the NASDAQ projection. Um, I think that whatever that number you could tell me right now, I think it's very clear that it's going to be higher anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm it would put us over 20. We would start the year with well over 24 in many of our classrooms. Right, and so you just have zero room, and no. that's based on. And you, ha how many classrooms are in the building? We have 24. Okay. So that was the other thing when you asked if we were looking at, at mm -hmm. trying to go to 25. The budget impact would not just be the classroom teacher. Right. It has budget impacts across specialists if we go up to 25. I, I did a lot of analysis looking at scheduling. But yes, it's not just the classroom teacher. It's also a space issue. Space. Okay. I am pretty opposed to having classrooms full day without windows. I think fourth and fifth graders need to be able to see and have natural sunlight. Yeah even on cloudy days. But. That's what I suspected. Thank yeah. you. And so I do have a couple of other questions. I think the math coach um, sounds very powerful and based on your experience with the reading coach as well. But I do see that we also still have a math tutor. Yep. So can you mm -hmm. talk about why we need both of those? Absolutely. Or why, you know, why that isn't something that sure. got reduced to add the Absolutely. I, it, we, we had a lot of conversations back and forth, um, Central Office and myself, as we were talking about this. The reading position is a full-time reading specialist teacher on the teacher scale. So right now, she does provide, in the fall, she was doing about 60% intervention work, about 40% coaching. We are meeting right now, we're looking at the data. Some of those students have been exiting out as we speak and moving out. in this by after winter vacation, we'd be looking at probably about 40% of our time doing intervention, 60% coaching. So that position is a 1.0 classroom teacher scale. We have the tutor, which is obviously not on the teacher scale. It's a, it's a C paraprofessional role. Those, that position is providing intervention supports. In the math workshop model, with differentiated instruction, we have the mini lesson that's presented, and then the students break up and to do work. There's that independent, you may, if, as parents, you might know, we move into guided practice and then independent practice. And there are some students that never reach independent practice. And with mathematics being the, the, the span of skill level by fourth and fifth grade, you have students who still haven't mastered basic facts who are gonna need that kind of work and then you have students who really need um, a lot of differentiation on the other end of the scale. Um, we still believe strongly in the model of a workshop to meet all of those needs, but you have your classroom teacher working alone. So an interventionist, as far as a tutor, can go in and support that model. In Hopkins, most of that work of the math tutor is supporting the classroom teacher. They are more skilled than our general education paraprofessionals. They have a greater level of expertise, knowledge. They go and work with the CTLs. They work with Dr. Kavanaugh on math standards, understanding the math curriculum, the programming we use. So they can go in and work, but they're not a classroom teacher. This coaching position is a little different. So when I think about it, as far as actual costs, it's very comparable. So you have a .4 classroom teacher combined with a 1.0 C paraprofessional. That cost to me is about the same. But what this would allow me is to have that number of hours of that tutor going around to work with 24 classrooms, okay. right? Okay. You still have that providing the intervention supports. Okay. The coach is just coaching. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And I mean, it, over time, is it your expectation that the allocation of that time would shift as the math coach, you know, sort of is more integrated into, and the teachers have had, had benefited more from the work with the math coach? So a point four to me is the minimum. Mm -hmm. Because what that allows, I mean, thinking about it scheduling wise, she spends one day on in fourth grade. If she hits six classrooms for math one week, six the next week, she's hitting each classroom 
twice in a month to go in and work with the classroom teacher during their math instruction. I think ongoing support when you're talking about the difference between having, I've taught in middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they teach math all day long. Mm -hmm. It is very different, as I said, when you're a generalist and you don't have that opportunity to hone your lessons in the same way. And to me, when you're talking and you look at those math frameworks at fourth and fifth grade, how complex and how deep the level of understanding is expected of our students. I would see that we need ongoing work, and this is why many districts have math specialists. This is why many districts have math coordinators um, to coordinate the efforts across levels. I don't have the ability to put that in my Hopkins budget. Right, right. What I can do is say, this is what I want and need for our fourth and fifth grade. And given where Hopkins is a dip in our MCAS in this district, I think it's also a very worthwhile place to put our efforts and see how this model works and potentially expand upon it you know if there was more money in other years okay thank you and then just a small question probably but what um what is the impact of reducing the lunch monitor of, is that an elimination or just a reduction it is a reduction um i mean we were asked elimination. to make Right, as many exactly. cuts as possible yeah. and look at where could we make some changes. One of the things, um, talking with the other schools, the math tutor is a paraprofessional role. There are more classrooms at lunchtime, so potentially um, utilizing staff, staff in different ways to okay. help support our lunches in order to make that possible. I mean, obviously I feel very passionate and yeah. that this position is necessary, so I was looking for any yeah. ways possible to help reduce. So but to, to clarify, choices. Vanessa, it does eliminate your lunch monitor. Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. But you'll find another way to supervise the children. Yeah, yeah, I was just now that I have my like portable principal, I'm getting a lot of emails. lunches because I can work on my laptop from my <laughs> With your principal roving, station. That's right. Yeah. You did see that. That's exciting. Okay. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have questions, or can I turn it over uh, to I do. Yeah. I found my, you know, the internet finally worked, so I'm referring back to the email that I had sent. Um, <coughs> so just a couple more, please. Um, what is the new equipment that you're requesting uh, with the 9.4K amount, 9,400? It's uh, new equipment. Mm. That's mostly, I, I, I can, I'll answer that, that bit. It's, it's, it's the, the copy release. Costs. I see. They're put into the, into the school budgets, right? Yep. And it's the expenses to um, to supply her additional classroom. I see. Yep. So About a thousand of that. I see. So the copier costs are going the new equipment? That's correct. And that you'll see that because I, I believe you asked that question in, in several buildings. Yes. It's the, it's the copier lease. I see. I so see. if you look, you can see that this last year it was 14,000. Next year we're looking at 9,400. So I've eliminated all, all equipments as far as every year we've had to replace easels, uh, kidney tables. That's what I was talking about. I've eliminated all of those furniture costs, yeah, and I'm going to take from center <laughs> this next year. So that's hey, so my, the what's remained is of is this what you see each year from the copy. The previous year being fourteen thousand was because it was copy costs plus um, tables, chairs. Sure. And um, there is a hundred and seventy-six thousand dollar increase in teacher salaries, right? Yep. So does that include the new teacher? Yes, the so that teacher? is a 1.4 FTE increase. The 1.0 is the classroom teacher, the 0.4, but that's not that whole cost. A lot it's of it steps is steps and lanes. As well. lanes. Okay. Yep. So teachers, as they move, a, a good significant portion of that is due to steps and lane increases. Yep. Just not COLA. Right. Okay. And uh, why is there a reduction in the librarian salary? That's a... It's a change in personnel. personnel. Okay. 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 Can Thank we, you. Can we turn it over to our partners yes. on yes. the town side? Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I thought it was a pretty comprehensive mm -hmm. explanation. I oh. Thank you. I think any time we can get the message out in the community that we sit here and talk about how we buy markers better, mm -hmm. that's a good message to put out there. It sounds silly and trivial, but it's really important to the average taxpayer who you know, hears about teachers and ratios and you know contracts and things like that, but doesn't hear about all this little minutia that all adds up. But to a lot of people, they don't get too high. They don't want to go up there. They like 
you know, they focus in on how many markers of people you know, we're buying. So I think there's got to be a way to sort of get that message out there more uh, as we go through this process. Are you implying that this is not a highly rated show? <laughs> well, there's a football game on. It's about 13 minutes. <laughs> Quick, Anne. I'll be fast. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. You ready yeah. for me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So at Elmwood School, uh, we currently have 508 students, and we're expecting to have 518 next year. Um, but when you break it down by grade, we are expecting 30 more second graders and, and ex expecting maybe 14 less third graders. So in my requests for personnel, I've asked for two additional classroom teachers. I didn't specifically call out yet um, second grade because I'd like to reserve um, the right to, to move folks as I need them, but, but I'm imagining that that will be in the second grade. Um, as Vanessa has already indicated, we've, got, we've received six new students in the last two weeks. Um, and I know that when I was walking out of the office today, there was a phone call. Uh, and, and of course, my, my admin assistant, she, when she gets the message, she's, okay, yes, yes. But, you know, she's very thoughtfully answering questions about inviting new folks in, and then she's looking at me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we smile and say, you know, bring it on. We'll, we're, we're happy to have all those kiddos. Um, so if I, what that looks like at Elmwood next year would be 13 grade two classrooms and 12 grade three. Um, we, we currently have 12 in the third grade, so that would be the same. Um, likely I would do that. And the average class size would be 20.5 students in second grade and 21 in first grade. We currently have um, about 23 in most classrooms. Some classrooms have 21, but um, we're hovering around 23 in most classrooms. And we think that's a little bit high, but it, it's manageable. Um, but it's especially in the second grade when you start looking at classrooms of 24 and 25, um, that's just, a, it's a lot to manage and it's a lot, I think we're doing a really nice job of meeting the needs of students and we want to continue to do that. So um, the other, I'll, I'm going to save my ask for last, my big ask for last. Um, in terms of um, expenses, you, you probably laugh if you could see me going through the budget as if it's my own personal budget. I'm asking, <laughs> excuse me, why did we spend $25 here? Or, and, and some people think that's silly, but we really, uh, uh, my admin assistant and I really went through our budget very carefully. She was up in a, in a place that we refer to at Elmwood as the dungeon, and that's where we keep supplies, which is a horrible name for a place. Um, and and we we're going through and saying, no, you can't have notebooks next year because look at all this paper that no one has used, and we'll staple it together, and, and you'll use it, and when you've used it, you can have more. <laughs> um, and uh, we're really looking at who, how many pencils do you have in your room? I'm not going to order more. I, I did the same. Um, it, we, it was suggested that we should really include family school supplies in our budget, and so we looked at that. Um, even though that is an increase of about $5,000 to the overall budget, I think my supplies came in at about $377 less. Um, again, that is uh, adding two classrooms, but not adding additional costs for furniture and things. Um, we'll take from um, center school, and we'll also, we've got chairs in corners that we really are asking folks to look at what we have and, and use what we have. Um, and so I, I'm not asking for any additional um, money in our expense accounts. The, the big ask for me um, on my expense summary is for a .5 adjustment counselor. We currently have a guidance counselor who is a teacher. She teaches part of the time, and uh, meaning that she goes into different classrooms and, and presents guidance lessons. They talk about the importance of if you see something, say something, bullying, um, messages for children. Uh, an adjustment counselor would provide more of crisis intervention. We do have students in grades two and three that come to us with, with really challenging emotional and behavioral issues, and I'd like to have a, a what I call a dream team uh, of folks that can meet the needs of kids in, in grades two and three um, emotionally and, and socially. Um, I would like to have an additional staff member who can bridge home and school. Uh, what, what we were, are hoping for is if we can really meet the social emotional needs of all of the students that uh, down the road it, that we can re reduce the um, out of district budget by providing what kids need in, in our school. Um, maybe some therapeutic 
programs for kids who are struggling. Um, I, I think that the existing staff is working really hard to meet the needs of everybody, um, but it would, would be really nice to have an adjustment counselor to help us. I, it's something that we've talked an awful lot about um, in terms of having mindfulness and creating, we're asking teachers to create social emotional learning curriculum and we talk about the importance of making sure that everybody feels safe and happy in school um, and I just think it's an important addition to the staff to have an adjustment counselor to work with us. And before you finish that comment, um, am I right in assuming that they would also provide direct services for students in crisis? Yes. You are. And, and one of the things that's happened with our guidance counselor, whose main purpose is, she, our guidance counselor is a 504 coordinator, so she meets with families um, on, on 504 writing and, and overseeing, and an adjustment counselor would work with students on IEPs. The, the caseload for our adjustment counselor has gotten so large that we have actually had to pull back some of her direct services with students because she's managing, meet, you know, she attends every IEP meeting mm -hmm. that we have in the building. You um, mean your guidance counselor? Yeah. You said adjustment counselor. Oh, sorry, okay. adjustment current, counselor. You current, she doesn't currently have one, right? That's no, I'm sorry. No, I don't. And yeah. so she went mm -hmm. from, we, there were 13, 15 students on IEPs in 2013, and we currently have 21 students who the guidance counselor is overseeing yeah. um, those meetings in addition to her 504s. Uh, and, and so this staff person would be a teammate to our guidance counselor and take on some of that work so that we can continue to provide su services for students yeah. and, um, and families. Much as they do it, much as you do it at the Hawkins That's School. That's right. right? Yep. Yep. That's Same right. model. Okay. Does anybody have questions? You answered my only question with your final comment there, so I'm all done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Concerning the guidance counselors, of course, case load. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mina. I know you got him. You mentioned the therapeutic environment in your overview. Could you explain a little bit about that? So there, sometimes students come to us with with um, an emotional need that that, that st they struggle in a gen ed classroom. So there are times when they have, they may not be on an IEP for their educational services, but they need support emotionally. And so having someone that they could work with when they're feeling dysregulated, when they're in a gen ed classroom and maybe can keep up academically, but the social demands of a, a classroom environment become a, an issue for those kiddos, this would be someone who could work with them, maybe in another classroom, maybe one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it would really depend on the specific needs of the student, but it's a, a little bit more meeting the needs. This is b beyond just typical social emotional support, but really meeting the needs of, of some specific students. Um, and I also noticed that there's no cost towards the ELA, math, science, or music. I think it's over just year. where the money is. Itemize, we do have costs for that, okay. but it's all lumped into one place it's on the budget sheets. Under okay. expenses. So um, okay. it, it, I think that's just a, 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 a formula that, that we use to. I see. So we do have those costs. General supplies. And, and those have level. all stayed really pretty much um, status quo. Yeah. And the same for the new equipment, it's the copier lease. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. Um, and in general, I'm. I'm very happy to see that you are asking for more manageable class class sizes. I think that goes a long way for every for individual child's sure. experience. And and kids at that age really it's it's very important to them to have one on one time with a teacher. So I think teachers can manage a class size of twenty four or twenty five, but that reduces the amount of time that each student has with with their important adult at school. Yeah. And, and thank you for all that you do at Elmwood. Thank you. With what you have. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I, I have just a, a quick clarification. The, the adjustment counselor, and th this is, forgive my ignorance, but th th in terms of background, an adjustment counselor and a guidance counselor, they would be teammates, but are they differently trained or are they similarly That's a great certified? question. They, it, they, I think they can be similarly trained, but an adjustment counselor has a different license. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I'm all set. Um, I just have one question, and I, um, if you were to only increase one teacher, how, what kind of impact would that have on your class size? 
I, we went back and forth. I don't know if you're able to look at, uh, is it Form A, where if you change the number to 12? I, I believe it, it adds another two students approximately to every classroom. The math. And the math. Math. Yeah. Starting with right. like 23. Yes. And, and how many? These, I should have uh, That's okay. asked you this in advance. How many students over your projections are you this year? Um, let's see. I have a sheet. It might take me a second to show She's right here. Plus 30 minus 40. Well, that's, you mean oh, from last year? Last year's that's projected. from last year, but. Um, looks like you're up, so up about, I was about five and about three, okay. and then you've, you've added another five. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then you said you had there, like you're still having a moment. Sorry, yeah, that's not good. Uh, it, it's important to note that Ann already reduced by one. So from the very beginning, from those those numbers that I showed you uh, from November the second, mm -hmm. um, okay. in, in our second go round, mm -hmm. um, th I think there was an increase, right? Didn't you on didn't classroom you teachers? With, yeah, didn't you start off with one more than you currently have? I don't think no? so. Okay. I think I started off with two. Okay. And how many actual well, classrooms? That was you, Vanessa. I yeah, have 27 classrooms. Okay. So 27. when the marathon school, I have four mm -hmm. classrooms currently being used for, for preschool. Right. So I have four of back. available <laughs> classrooms. People are already uh -huh. <laughs> buying for Blaming. them. So they we are air conditioned. And, so. they, and they, well, two of them are. Two, okay. Um, and we lost, uh, the health teachers gave their classroom yep. um, to the preschool. So we have health, last year we had health on a cart, which was really, uh, it worked. The teachers made it work and they were wonderful about it. But um, it was challenging because the health teachers used they use technology and what they were sort of struggling with is they'd go into one classroom that had a slightly different technology and then they'd plug their things into it they wouldn't be able to make it work a teacher who's using that technology all day knows that that's what she or he is working mm -hmm. with but for the health it, it, it created a stress that mm -hmm. was new to them so this year we actually moved health to the the computer lab and all of the compu the technology is be being delivered on carts, which makes more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the health room is the computer lab, which for them, it's an environment that feels a little bit, um, it's not as warm as their classroom is. So they would like one of the classrooms. So that really leaves us with three, which is perfect. <laughs> because Great. we'd like to put science in a classroom <laughs> too next year. So, we, so this isn't perfect. being driven by space necessarily. Either. No, like good. no. Okay. We have a little, a tiny bit of room to grow. Okay. Um, do any of you have questions for Elmwood? Um, yeah, just one one question. With the uh, the full day kindergarten making its way through the the grades, um, you made some comment about the need for IEP help. The full day kindergarten was supposed to reduce the need for that as we get into the older grades. Uh, can you comment about what has been the impact? My, the comment about the IEPs was that the guidance the guidance counselor is oversees the, those students. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, we were looking. You know, when we started the full day kindergarten, the long term was that with full day kindergarten there would be a reduced need for IEP as these sure. kids matriculate okay. through the. Mm -hmm the different yeah. schools yeah. and now that we're in the El that they're getting through the Elmwood school have we been seeing a reduced need for that kind of extra help? you know it's really hard it, it's hard to make that determination because the other thing that with the enormous influx of students we're getting students from communities outside of Hopkinton so we had several students this year who came to us that were on an IEP we w didn't account for those kiddos in particular so um, I think that Full day kindergarten as those kids move through. We, we last year we started foundations, or was that a year, two years ago? And the teachers are now really starting to see the impact of um, a, a curriculum that is crossing from Center to Elmwood. I think that we're going to see um, a positive change over time. I, I can't really speak to particularly um, the the half day kinder. I think I came in just as that was changing from half day to full day and. I, I think the students seem so well prepared, but we we still we have gone up on IEPs at Elmwood School, and sometimes at Elmwood School, that's the age where it's more appropriate to notice that you know to identify uh, an individual need for kiddos. So 
I don't know if that would be considered unusual. And I would, I would add, um, as a special educator, mm -hmm. looking at Hopkins, Hopkinton's percentages of special education students, they are very commiserate with other similar districts of our um, makeup. What we have been seeing, just like I know Dr. Kavanaugh has talked about the changing L population, we, we do have demographic changes that are very noticeable. Just in the four years I've been here at Hopkins, um, the demographics have changed. And we're seeing that in the need for L services and as Ann spoke to special education services and the types of students and supports that they require. Um, but okay. overall, consistent percentages to other districts of similar demographics. Do you have some information, Dr. Kavanaugh? According to DESE information, which is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, in 2013, our number of students on IEPs was 459, and in 2017, it had dropped to 436. So that's fairly substantial. Okay. And the enrollment would have been higher. And the enrollment has grown. It's higher yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. As, a, as, a, as a percentage. Yeah. 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 And we, yeah. we call that radar slide as well. Um, mm -hmm. that, that we looked at a few meetings ago mm -hmm. um, around percentage statewide <coughs> comparisons around, uh, right? Um, but it's a very complex, it's a great question mm -hmm. and it's a very complex answer mm -hmm. and you managed it very well. Okay. And, so um, in summary, it, it has been helping but with new students moving in who haven't gone through, started in kindergarten, it, it's offsetting a lot of that benefit. Well, and I think, I mean, it's a good segue, although I don't want to jump in before Brian's had a chance to ask questions, but I know, Lauren, um, one of the things that we've celebrated or you've, you've brought to our attention and then we've celebrated is, um, you know, just the reduction of the need for the co-teaching um, the, the, with, with the reading class at the kindergarten level. So, um, and, and something, um, just if I may point out, Ian talked about the guidance counselor involvement on students with IEPs. I think that speaks to the need for that social emotional um, guidance um, therapy aspect, hence the ask for an adjustment counselor. It doesn't necessarily um, indicate a change with the academic needs, but in addition to things that students, the guidance counselor is more involved in the programming of those students just because of the, the regulations um, ability to handle social situations, navigate um, daily unexpected events. Um, so that may be a factor as well. Mm. Okay. Thank you. That, that's Thank it. you. Thanks. Did you have any questions, Brian? What is the state, I mean, not state average, but what's the average classroom size for these grades in high performing districts around the state? Does anybody know what that would be roughly? I mean, these average, these, <laughs> <laughs> she's on it. Um, on it. <laughs> we have a Hopkinton goal, right, of about 21 to 23. We do, um, and I know that we, we were asked this question, and John, you might remember this, um, as part of the MSBA process. So the numbers are pretty standard um, between 20 and 24 at the elementary level, mm -hmm. lower for K-1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, statewide. Statewide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we went, it was, it's 18, 18, 18 and 21, 21. kindergarten and first, mm -hmm. and when we went to the MSBA, they basically said that that was the right target number, so for, for a building. So we're there in general. We're there. Are, are we're fighting to stay there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we haven't been there. Okay. This budget would provide, um, and with the opening of the marathon school and the the ability for Lauren to reduce those class sizes, because now she has, because now she has room. Her numbers, and we we made this point. Um, uh, her numbers have continued to grow because there haven't been anywhere to put the kids. If she had had room, she would have been asking for, for additional teachers over the past couple of years. I know, I know, Mike, we talked about this at the last meeting. Um, but to answer your question, Brian, we, we feel really good about where we are in Hopkinton with this budget. Um, in terms of class size, we don't feel good with what the increase we're asking for. But it does take us to a place, given our capacity for housing the students now um, and the programs that we're offering, to a place that we feel really, really good about. So either I haven't been paying attention to that point this year, we haven't made that point enough this year in our discussions. Okay. But it's probably the former than the latter. But um, I think that's an important thing to make sure everybody understands as we go through a budget where we're looking at that kind of increase. 
Yes, but we're finally getting to where we want to get to with our ratios, yeah. which is a big driver at cocktail parties and sports events all over the time. Yeah, right. well, and, and to both Anne and Lauren, we haven't let her speak yet, um, Anne's getting four classrooms back, and this is all because of the opening of the new school, right? So, and, you know, I think, and I, I won't lose track of um, uh, the, the opportunity to say, that Vanessa is at capacity, and I did hear Anne say that they have a little wiggle room. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we've got room to grow is very short-lived, mm -hmm. and and it's going to be really important given that the MSBA we did all just receive a letter that we were not invited in. Um, so we need to not lose sight of this the fact that we we it's going to be very important to continue to drive the need for something, whatever that might look like, um, a renovation a new wing, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. um, at the elementary level. So then just shifting gears a little bit, um, not so much specific to Ann's school, but I always love the Hellboy Eagle, I just think that's the Because <laughs> um, I look at the budget kind of from where I sit in town, we have a 2% growth roughly in the population of students, right? We have a 2% increase based on special education alone. There's four. Yeah. This is in my simple little mind. Okay. And we have a 1% transportation increase. Huh. So there's five right there. Mm -hmm. So now there's, we're talking about eight roughly. So what are the other key drivers from that simplistic view? That well, one of the, people one of the big ones on? actually is the utilities of the new building because it's so much bigger. That, that was the one that caught me by surprise. And, uh, I would and say the most. Well. <clears throat> so yeah, so transportation, and then, um, well, as part of enrollment is the English yeah. language learners. Um, Plus, aren't we at 3.2 on fixed costs anyway? Yeah. Personnel, you, yes. you just do staff so and lanes. Just regular yeah, staff. Yeah, 3.2 is your staff. regular staff. So I'm just trying yeah. to think, right. as, we, yeah. as we try to figure out how we do this in town, you know, what of that five, and 2% of the increased kids showing up, kiddos showing up, right? We get 2% more. <laughs> There's 2% cost that comes with 2% more, roughly. You've got 2% in special education. Mm -hmm. That is our moral obligation, I believe, to fund. You have 1% in transportation, so that's five. And then you have 3% fixed cost, which would include salaries, increases, steps, lanes, all that's that. a good right? summary, Brian. Mm -hmm. What Have about paying attention. Good job. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the buildings and grounds and the athletics items that we had? Those were also, I thought those were also two items where we had some increase, didn't Yeah, you? but yeah, so that's the part of, part of the three. Part that of the three point three, three, most likely. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because I see, the, I see the athletic fees kind of, in my mind anyway, sort of covering. It, it of the did, uh, the increase in the fees. Yeah. yeah. But even that out. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I thought of one question that I forgot to ask you, Ian, and then we can move on to Lauren. I know that overall you have a reduction in your supply account, but in terms of the amount, I know all of you were asked to identify the amount. If you were to take some of that um, supply cost off the shoulder of the parents, what do you know what the amount it was, particularly yes, is for you? It, for me, it came out to be between the two grades, five thousand twenty-six oh nine. And is that something philosophically that you guys feel needs to happen this year, or is that something that could be put off? I, it's a I good question. <laughs> yeah, we did the same kind of analysis at Hopkins that you did sitting in the supply rooms, and ours was about 5,600. Yeah. But um, we absorbed most of it, which is why the costs didn't go up as much. Um, You're talking about this, the crayons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're just about the same numbers, slightly higher. Mm -hmm. I think th for me, yeah. I, I personally think there are families who feel like kids should come to school and have the things, you know, have pencils and scissors and crayons provided. I think there are other families who think that buying those supplies are part of the, you know, preparing for school. Let's go to Walmart, let's get our crayons and get you ready to go. Um, so I imagine that depending on who you ask, they'd say, I'd like that all provided at school. Um, and someone else might say, I'm happy to provide it. And I don't know whether it, it makes sense to do it now. Um, 
I guess that we'll wait and see what happens. <laughs> right? that's and that's a very good segue. <laughs> but it is a reduction that they were asked to make, yes. Jean, just, yeah, no, just I, to clarify. I know it was math. They, they didn't offer it up. It. No, no, I know. <laughs> and I, um, <laughs> they were asked to do it. And so. I know it's a little bit different for Marathon, but I'm just going to ask you the same question just so you know when uh -huh. we get there. Um, okay, so go ahead. So this is my very first time presenting the marathon budget. A few oh. times I know I still called it center. I'm getting there. It's, I have to transition from the new building to marathon, but it is a great place to be. So um, just going to talk a little bit about where we are now in regards to class size. We do have four first grades with 24 because we have nowhere else to go. And while we have excellent teachers, fabulous um, you know, staff with, with their expertise, it is a challenge to meet the needs. And speaking of those parents earlier, we strive to provide targeted, focused intervention that we're continually revisiting, progress monitoring, because we want to know our instruction is effective. It, it's different from years ago, beginning of the year, end of the year test. How do we do? We are continually assessing our children um, through observation, formal assessments, interim assessments, to make sure that our instruction is effective. Um, and our my proposed budget for Marathon provides opportunities for that to excel. So looking to our um, budget and class size, I am thankful that the town approved the addition mm -hmm. in January, which provided four classrooms. But being mindful of the overall budget, I will be seeking to use three of those. Um, not just filling the space, because the space was there, but what is it that would provide those targeted class size? And for K-1, it is 18 to 20 in a class. I think this is my first time, so this is my current fifth year in Hockington, that I will be able to do that for all of those classes. I have not been able to do that. Um, so looking for next year, NESDAC recently uh, produced some uh, recent enrollment um, predictions. So Marathon will be 429 students, K-1, and including, we'll add preschool to that, which we have the ability to provide for 82 preschoolers. So it'll be a little over 500. But looking for that, we will have um, preschool in our building. While it's four physical classes, it is six integrated classes, eight classrooms, because the programming varies in preschools. You'll have one teacher who will teach 15 students in the morning, 15 students in the afternoon. We have two teachers with such program. We have two other teachers who will teach a half day of focused in um, students with intensive special needs and a half day integrated session. So that's where you get some children that attend a full day program, another integrated session. So we'll have six opportunities for integrated sessions where community peers are able to submit for a lottery, for enrollment, participate in our fabulous program while meeting the needs of our um, students with disabilities. We will uh, be looking for um, 12 full day kindergarten classrooms. So ensuring that we are doing what is mindful, what we need, but not just what we're able to have. So with those classrooms, we will average 17 in a class. Knowing that we'll probably get a few more, we will meet our target of the 18 to 20 in a class. We, I, I have emails regularly. When, is in, uh, when are you in the new building? When can my child attend? Um, quite often I have to share your policy, which I'm thankful you have for K-1 age entry enrollments. Um, because that is very helpful to me when parents want to rush childhood and bring their children to school. We will have, um, so we will have that 12 kindergarten classes and we will have 13 first grade classes that we're seeking. For the 13 first grade classes, our projected enrollment at this time is 18 in a class. This gives us su sufficient, and I don't, would never say that, wiggle room. So if we have children move in, if we have 25 children move in over the summer, dispersing them amongst these classes, we would still be 20 in a class. Um, I've never been able to say that. It almost is, um, I don't know, it, that's, that's reality. It's a wonderful place to be. Mm -hmm. So when we look at, okay, preparing for these classes, being mindful of, of what else that we need, looking at supplies, we did factor in some of the items that were on parent requests, what would that be if we did add them to our school budget? So similar to the other buildings, it comes to approximately $4,500. So when you look at the overall general supply increase, increase from 21 to 25 K-1 classes, the addition of preschool, because they will also be drawing from our general supplies, and these additions, 
we are increasing our general supplies by approximately ninety five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like when you look at um, <laughs> when you look at uh, adding those classes in terms of materials, supplies, and um, as we are sharing our furniture at Center School, which it's not necessarily consistent, it's in varying states of condition um, throughout the district, we, um, we are mindful to use what we can, be resourceful with what elsewhere, and um, what we can, we are including in the um, ff &E, furniture fixtures and equipment <laughs> for the new building. So that is why you don't see copiers in my line item, um, as everyone else has. So that we, we will have copiers at um, Marathon, but they are not part of this budget. Whenever we were able to have such items in that budget, that's where we have worked on. And, and I have to do some trimming in that budget, um, but we will get there. I think that is the highlight of the budget. Um, and when you talked about utility costs, so the center school is currently um, approximately 52,000 square feet. Marathon's approximately 88,000 square feet. So we have space. We, we don't, I mean, I just thank you for that building. <laughs> okay. So, I'm just, right. Okay. So do you, <laughs> Do you have any questions? Can I, before you, they yes. do that, Lauren, um, I'd like to just remind the school committee of the ghost of, of uh, budgets past um, yes. and the fact that you sat here for the past two years asking for pretty much nothing around materials and supplies um, because you were being so responsible about using up. And I remember you sitting there saying, you know, not only I don't want to have to uh, the district to have to bear the cost of moving the supplies. So I just want to remind all of us that we expected a quite a large increase in this area from you this year. Um, and it's just a good reminder for all, us all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll start. start for sure. All right. Um, so how many Good students question. have increased in the last two weeks? <laughs> 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 we have a few. I don't think we're up to six, but um, we have someone that is in the process. Now, within the last three weeks, I could say. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. McLeod, I'm just wondering, what was the projection that NESDEC made for this year mm -hmm. uh, when the budgets were put together? And throughout the year, ju if in just two weeks we are seeing this increase, are we prepared for the next year adequately with with everything that's going on, and and I'm just want, I'm certainly curious to see what was the projection, and where are we? <laughs> it's not clear to me. Right. And when I keep and hearing I that in two weeks, if you're seeing this, mm -hmm. and I don't know if December is the yeah. popular month to move. And I did ask. Um, you do have the presentation now in your email um, from where we did show the Nesdec, the comparison between the Nesdecs and the actuals. But I think what is really <coughs> delightful to think about for Lauren for the first time ever is that she feels confident that there's room. Mm -hmm. There's room, sufficient room, both in K and 1 um, for to allow for beyond projection um, because she can disperse them across 25 classrooms. Um, and with, with keeping class size the way she has planned, um, she, I know I'm speaking for her, I'm preaching for the choir here, but I know there's confidence that there's, there's lots of room, <coughs> even if we go well beyond what the projection is. Okay. And I'm just curious to know what, how, how far are we in this year from the projection? Mm -hmm. Just so we have some sense, we know that there's more development happening, yep. we know too? there are more families moving into town. Overall, yeah. So overall, Nina, we went. We were actually overall down by twenty <coughs> from the. Project. So that's preschool through grade twelve. Yep, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Uh, this is, is just K one. Oh, it is. Oh, just K one. Um, it is interesting. Um, you know, I think that we look at move ins and moves out, move outs, but um, beyond what was projected, it was actually a surprise to us when we started doing this this work for. Um, for the budget because it wasn't what we were facing with the incredible number of move-ins that we were facing over the summer. Um, but overall, that's, that's where, where we At ended up. At the center up. level, mm -hmm. the center. Okay. So you were down 20 from the projection, mm -hmm. not down 20 prior to the year. Are these right? the, from the projections? Yeah. Right. Those are revised projections, so those are going to be the actuals. 
they're still up. Uh -huh. like yeah, and years. right, you've got the most current in front of you. Okay, okay. And I don't know if it's like at the tip of your fingers. Uh, how about uh, Elmwood and uh, Hopkins? Elmwood was in our summary, right? Is, is that in what you just said? Yeah. So we have this is like Okay. So I think that's Elmwood was up to four. Up here. Yep. From the projection. Yep. Overall. Up four at Elmwood. And yeah, I've, the, the projections were um, not as far off as. And that do, that doesn't count the six that started right. recently, right? <laughs> so right, you've, you've got, got, you've got, you've got, you've got okay. to so now. keep yeah. so keep in mind this is the Nesdaq projection to what we had October one. Yeah. I see. Okay. okay, so things obviously, as you hear, continue to change. Sure. Okay, Hopkins nineteen was up. Yeah, nineteen. We were up it's nineteen by October first, and yep. since October first, I think we we had seven in the last two week I think we're up ten or twelve since October first. That's why we have class sizes of twenty five. No. Were yeah. any students moving? Not really. Uh, we had two move out. Yeah. And I've had two. Yeah. Two. But this so speaks to the slide. challenge, right? This yeah. is this is not so. And people also look at the aggregate overall number of, of how yeah. much Nesdaq was off on their projections, and that doesn't really tell a story because next year we could be sitting here and it, the numbers could be completely different. You could be down yeah. four, you could be yeah. up 19, you could be, I, it, it's, yeah. it, we have seen, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I know we've been watching this closely in the whole five years I've been on this committee and there's no pattern. Yeah, it's true. In the slide that you have, um, to your point about the move outs, there are 58 in and six out um, overall since, off, since the beginning of the year. Yeah. But you're right, John, it's in and out and yeah, All no kinds pattern. of grade levels. Mm -hmm. Way more in than out, though. Is oh, the yeah. is mm -hmm. the track? Uh -huh. yes. That, is. that pattern's consistent, yeah. right? Hopkins. Which I think is which, which I think is what, again. It's what we see the the where possible we're seeing that built in flexibility, right? So as you said on the just the fourth classroom, let's not just use it to use it, but we know it's there mm -hmm. for either future years or if we sort of have to pull a ripcord somewhere, right? I mean, it's yeah. I think that's that's to me. It's great to get to these target class sizes. It's even better to hear that we're not, I feel like in the past years, it's been a discussion of, yeah, we can make it work, but yeah. let's hope we don't get a lot more kids. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. And so now it feels like we can breathe a little bit more, yeah. which is important. Absolutely. Um, I have one other question for you. I recall there was a conversation that there would be a reduction in Paris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit to that, please? When we look at our class size, um, we currently have 24 in a class, 23, 21 in a class, so we have um, asked for and sought additional paraprofessional support to help meet their needs. So with the class size of 17 or 18, we are able to do so more with the professional teacher with that. So we were able to look at responsibly where could we do that. We looked at some area towns, what are their ratios like in terms of, terms of support staff. So that's where those reductions came from. Um, Thank yes. you. And that's also a factor of having a bathroom in the kindergarten classroom as we're, as we're Supposed yeah, so be. preschool and kindergarten classrooms, um, something that we are not able to do at center, but um, code now is that they have a bathroom right. right in the classroom. So that will ease the day, the time on learning will be increased and um, people can- The number of walks. Go flash, wash, leave, and get back to business. Those are our <laughs> four rules. <laughs> it takes us a little while, yeah, just those four bits. Um, but it can be a challenge when you've got to traverse to the end of the hall. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. Great. Any other questions, Jen? No. No. <laughs> okay. No, I'm good. Oh, I bet Evan didn't say that. No. He did not. <laughs> did not come up. Did not. Okay. Anybody? No. Um, any of our tech I friends? actually do. Um, when you were saying that talking about class size, and from the hand that we have, I see in kindergarten there's 202 students with 12 teachers, and this list is a class size of 16.8, but you were referencing 18 students in kindergarten. Is this, I think um, this has changed? For next or? year, nope, I, okay. um, next year, averaging 17 in class and 18 in first grade. So while, next step, while we get um, the percents, 
you know, um, 17.5 in a class, mm -hmm. I rounded it to 18. Right. Okay. 16.8. To 17 okay. I think Lauren's mention of Laura uh, of 20 was she feels comfortable that even if we got oh, those yes. additionals right. that got us to 20. Laura, well, yeah, I understand. Oh, sorry. I'm trying because I feel like right now we're actually below the 18 to 21. Um, yeah. Yep. And if, could we actually maybe not use all of you go down another size mm -hmm. classroom for each of the grades and still get you within the 18 to 21 ratio? Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just. Out yeah. there and I understand the excitement yeah. that you have yeah. room and you have space, but we're also facing a, a year where you have you know unexpected costs with you know the special education mm -hmm. and the math in the school, mm -hmm. you know, other additional costs that we're facing. And so um just wondering if there's potential to maybe limit and, and take out two of those like new classroom new teachers mm -hmm. here. Knowing you can yep. later. So I, I just asked Sue to just do the math here for us mm -hmm. on the chart. So if we were to reduce a kindergarten section then class size would be? 18.4. 18.4, uh, um, based on the NESDEC projections, not allowing for you know any changes right. from there. And similarly, if we did it at first grade, um, if we reduced a section, it would be? 19, roughly. Yeah. 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 yeah I, that, so, so my point is you still, though, I mean, you've got 12 and I have 11 and 12 classes, so, you know, as you said, if you get 22 students, you're still in up to 19. You haven't yeah. gotten up to the 20 or 21. Yeah. So you're still at the low end of that 18 to 21 range. So I, I get. I would just argue that at the, the place where it's the most important, where there's the biggest impact in the most research that would support class size less than 18, or at least between that critical 18 to 20, mm -hmm. is at K1, mm -hmm. K1-2 to be exact. Right. Um, beyond that, and as Vanessa has pointed out, you know, the, it, it, it's around classroom management, all of those kinds of things, right, as kids right. get older. So the desire to keep K1 below 18 right now mm -hmm. to allow us to build um, and I allow for the, uh, not the unexpected, but the inevitable move-ins because we're only basing this on the projection. Um, in addition to the ability that Lauren has had to reduce paraprofessional was a way of balancing off the budget impact. If we look at her whatever form it, the, the, the level is, uh, let's point, point them to the form where the overall increase is only one FTE. The way in which Lauren worked her worked the budget, the ins and the outs and the overalls. Um, mm -hmm. What form is it? Because they have it. Your pairs are going to be much lower. Of course, definitely, back at yet, Rebecca. Yes. Yeah. That is very true. And I remember when Don Kennedy came to one of our school committee meetings to talk. He talked about kindergarten being the most difficult year to predict. Predict. I can't recall his exact words, but. So while we look at that number now, I wouldn't be surprised if it changes from that. When I see the growth in town, when I see um, just um, families want to move to Hockington, right. Right. they're attracted by this new building as well. We have a lot of inquiries uh, about that that have started a year ago, which is wonderful and it's right. great. Um, so planning for that, I don't. I, I don't believe it will stay that way mm -hmm. over the course of the year. We just might remind you yeah. that we just heard that KLO is down 20 from the last year. Yeah. So I'd be curious to see. Yeah. And I go, I know, I, I think they're more aware now of the movements that, yeah. are, that are happening. Uh -huh. um, so they may be getting more accurate. But I'm just throwing that out. Yeah. 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 Well, I yeah. mean, I, I think, you know, Good Those question. are hard questions that we do have to ask us here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree. Well, how, wherever we land, it's responsible to ask that and what the impact would be. And just as a follow-on to that, if if we if we only increased by the two classrooms as opposed to the four, would that change what you've had to add in terms of like art, music, the I don't I don't remember what they call them, like marathon related arts or specials, specials. or whatever. Specials. So if it was a change. Um, Changing it by decreasing it three classes instead of adding four two. classes. If you were adding two, it would. Would it you would. not yeah. require as many? So it's just something to look at. I I don't. You know, it's hard to <laughs> after all the advocacy for the new building, so that we could have the appropriate class sizes mm -hmm. and the room for growth. It's hard to advocate now for not doing that, but it's also hard to look at this number. Um, as well, so. And just a reminder, I think it was 
an opportune time to add those four classrooms because of when it happened, oh, but not necessarily. I don't know if at that point in time we were thinking that you need to use all, all four of them. And obviously, you know, we've already tried to right. do that with the three, but um, yeah. I don't think we thought we were like first in so much that we we're going to fill those four up. And when we worked um, with MSBA, you know, 18 to 20 was our target. 18 to 20 was our target. So right now with the projections, first grade's there, you know. Um, right. So right. It, it would be difficult to change that, knowing that we're setting ourselves to be beyond that right. when we worked on the solution to center school, and right. that was part of it, is having appropriate space for our programming, appropriate class size, the school committee guidelines. So that was something that we strived for. Mm -hmm. If I could, I, I'd just like to share experience being on a school committee on another district that got a new building. And what I would say is we have families school shopping all the time. Our secretaries <laughs> field calls on a daily basis asking when that new school is opening and what grades it are, is in. And the district that I have recently been serving on school committee, we saw a tremendous number of students move in because of that new building specifically at those grade levels. Mm -hmm. So families that are school shopping with kindergartners and first graders, so to speak to increases here that I would expect, we saw tremendously higher numbers in that building at those grade levels than anybody expected. Families said, we're gonna move just so we can get into that new building. And I would not be surprised if that's what Lauren gets as well. I just thought we would have been for the new building. <laughs> 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 this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. so, so if I can just add to what Rebecca was say, saying is that it's not saying we're not gonna use the space, but this is kind of a shock year with right. the budget. Mm -hmm. Can you know do a little bit this year and then do phase it in a little bit next year or so. Do it over two years instead of just saying we gotta we have to add four new teachers this yeah, year. Yeah, no, I mean I, I I think again, I think it's responsible to ask the question given the context of the year that we're in. But I I don't want anyone to hear me saying that that's what I'm advocating for. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to, we're going to have to mm -hmm. take some time to reflect <laughs> on all of this now that we finally have the whole picture um, because we definitely mm -hmm. have some more work to do and I will, I will give you an update when we get around to um, my report about the ongoing budget conversations that we're having with our partners on the town side as well. But, um, you know, this is a stress that every department is, because people aren't, <laughs> People aren't only showing up at school every day. The police, the fire, the DPW, everybody has increasing mm -hmm. demands on them because of the number of families moving into town. And mm -hmm. so we're not alone in mm -hmm. the challenges that we're facing this year, for sure. Um, so does, uh, did you have questions? Did I skip over you? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, anybody else, or can we let them? Well, you were going to ask Lauren about crayons, and oh. I, I no, love I her No, I did. She actually <laughs> <laughs> told me four to five hundred dollars. Lauren, mm -hmm. yes, for supplies. Yeah. So, in sure. terms of um, if we purchase the sum, summer supplies, most of the summer supplies, because some of them you can get a better deal than we can, mm -hmm. probably more durable. So most all of the summer supplies would be forty five hundred dollars. Okay, she did. She yes. was very prompt to answer. <laughs> but, but she was. What do you want to know, <laughs> Lauren? You were very, you were very strong in your response to the importance of the quality of the crayon. Mm -hmm. So I did um, take a fine tooth comb to the bid list, and some of our preferred brands are yes. there because oh. when you when you which was nice to see because um, I don't think they always work. <laughs> She's not so gonna I'm not going to use that. <laughs> so she won't say what we're <laughs> referring Preferred to. So when you're looking at some of the supplies, if the quality of the product is poor, things break or whatnot, you're not saving money because you're buying more. Um, so we have certain things that we prefer um, and we can do that. Got it. So I, can I just say, though, that <laughs> it, 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 I know you were all asked. K1 to look. parents will know what I'm talking about because they see the supply uh, yeah. list. You were all asked asked to look at, at this, obviously. Um, yes. But uh, to echo what Mr. Hur said earlier, I think when you're talking about the bid lists, it, it makes it even more. This is not what what is being proposed in this budget is not a sort of lift and place of supplies that parents bought to the schools. You actually looked to the level of where can we get better deals? Yes. Are yes. the are yes. the are the brands so so the again the <laughs> this is not just a let's take a supply list, figure out exactly what it costs and ship yes, that over no. the budget. It's not everything. No and it's, it's also looking at where can we get economic leverage. Yes. And so uh, so again I I, actually where, did wherever it that we end way. up on that I appreciate the work that's and done. And mine I think it's a it's really about fourteen thousand dollars less I mean when we when we looked at where we could get better deals 
because I had a, an astronomical number in the beginning, and I said, I don't think I can put this in my budget. <laughs> yeah. And then my, <clears throat> my girlfriend showed me how to, <laughs> how to do <laughs> some shopping, and I, I whittled it right down. <laughs> I just would like to make this comment, and I'm glad, John, so glad you said that, because it reminded me of a comment that I wanted to make. Um, and that is that, you know, in our deliberations at central office, <clears throat> every single one of these principals was willing to offer up their own professional development um, that is budgeted. They, they, they said, I will let this, this, and this go before I will let that go. Um, and one of the things that they were willing to give up for the sake of their programs was their own professional development, um, to which I replied that I wouldn't even consider that um, offer. Uh, because their professional development as professionals just is just so important. But it just speaks to the level, as I'm listening to all of you tonight, and it goes without saying, but we all know that you can teach without materials and supplies. What I'm listening to you all talking about, and we know this to be true, is that the most important thing is your teachers in the classroom and, and what they do every day. And so they can, they can do it without the best mm -hmm. crayons, and they can do it... Um, but now the challenges that are that you are facing in supporting your your children's development overall are the kinds of things that I've heard you asking for throughout on your budget, and I just wanted to say that publicly because behind the scenes nobody would know that otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it speaks to just how passionate you are about what you are providing at your schools um, that you would you would offer that up. And so thank you. And thank you for your, your presentations tonight. Um, I mean, it truly always is very uplifting to listen <laughs> yeah. to you. I agree with the highlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, let it go. Cut it. <laughs> Before we let you go, just to, this is not even on our agenda, so someone yeah. can report me to the Attorney General if they like. Hearing you talk about the and hearing you talk so enthusiastically about your school and having had the opportunity through the superintendent search process to have gone in for a tour. Mm -hmm and seeing our partners here, sitting here. I would really love, John, if we could organize an opportunity to have the board select and the model classroom is gonna be done um, shortly. It should be done shortly. Um, so the model classroom, they'll have one classroom that will have all the casework, the floor, it, the grid will be filled in with the tiles. So the floor is not yet down, the grid is almost done, so it's almost complete. So even if you saw it in that almost complete stage for the mock up classroom, not the entire building, yeah. it would be powerful. So maybe just yeah. after the new year, if we could mm -hmm. create an opportunity for you and your colleagues to go in. And if I were invited, I'd be happy to tag along again. Because every time I went, it changed it in good. two days. There were clocks one yes, day. Yes, I know. And, and I, they, they're all telling the same time. <laughs> 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 Will mean so much to <laughs> us. The little things. Yes. So at any rate, that was that was not our agenda. That was just extra. Yes. But just hearing you talk with the level of excitement and yes. passion, and uh, you know, in particular, the dramatic um, contrast between touring the center school building and driving over yes. to the marathon building um, and doing that tour was just an eye opener and very exciting. So, and I'd be even willing to do the same. See where we are now, yeah. because I think that was powerful and just had such a greater appreciation and understanding of what we seek to do with our programming um, just really um, left, I think, an indelible mark on it, everyone that had that tour. No, that's a good Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, yes. all of you. Thank, and thank you. you for all thank the extra so time. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we're ready, we thank can you, move Carol. on to liaison reports. Um, Hi, thank you. I do have a report. I don't know. Does anybody else have liaison reports? Do they? I no. Have, I have a little one. Okay. Um, on the community communications, um, there were a couple of takeaways for me. We are looking to uh, partner with HCAM and create a calendar, a common calendar. So we have initiated that conversation. Jim Cousins had shown uh, enthusiasm to take that on. So that's where we are with it. And you know, we have other organizations like HPTA have everybody willing to participate in that. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Are you, you're gonna do the athletic one? I will, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so in your packet, I asked um, Dr. McLeod to put in your packet the draft of the 
a uh, memorandum of understanding that we have to date with Parks and Rec related to the athletic fields. Um, so you can just see uh, where we're going with the collaborative um, management of the fields, the partnership around um, sharing of costs, uh, revenue. So we are working with um, the town manager on how to set up our revolving fund and how to um, write the warrant so that it reflects the um, offset from CPC of $1.7 million for the project. But the piece that we hadn't discussed or, or shown you yet was, um, was this piece. So if anybody had a chance to look at it and had questions, I certainly can answer it. But mostly I just wanted you to have it for your information. Because on Tuesday, John and Dr. McLeod and I are going to the Board of Selectmen to um, just give them an update in general about the project. We'll show them the drawings. We'll show them the um, management MOU that we're working on and just answer questions and talk about timelines and CPC and CONCOM and all of those good pieces of information and, and good news. So I wanted to make sure before I went and shared it with other committees that you had the chance to see it. So that is why that was in there. Uh, did anybody have questions about that at all? No. Okay. Well, that's good news. We <laughs> must be doing something right. Um, and then also I just wanted to say, I guess this is, could sort of qualify just as my school committee chair report. So we did have um, a budget uh, advisory group meeting on Tuesday of this week, and we actually have scheduled another one for Monday because we're really up against it now. We're coming into you know the holiday break, and then we have our public hearing the first week of January, and we've got to make a decision, and we're way over where we were requested to be. So we have now finished uh, hearing all of the budget presentations, and we have some hard work to do. So um, I can report that. Um, you know, the town manager shared with us that all budget, uh, I mean, excuse me, all departments are having similar struggles to what we are having. Um, and we also did, because we are, are, we were already posted for a meeting on Monday night to um, to select our next superintendent. We actually just today added a budget discussion to that um, agenda. So we will meet at six o'clock to discuss the budget. So just reflections on this and directionally where we think we need to give some um, guidance to Dr. McLeod and, and to Ms. Rodemick so that they can go sharpen their pencils and do some more math. But so we also asked if we could have an additional meeting on Monday with the town manager and the chair of the Board of Selectmen um, just because I think they were doing some work this week that was going to result in some more information in terms of um, revenue numbers and as well as their own expenses, right? Yes, and they shared with us that they're in, you know, it, at the same place in the process with the other departments, but did not yet have that information to share mm -hmm. at our budget advisory meeting of this week. So we really felt that having this meeting tonight being at the end of our presentations, um, and they similarly are having at that, that place with the other departments, that coming together one last time would be really helpful, and hopefully there'll be more information to share and, and a little bit more direction mm -hmm. um, for us, yeah, mm -hmm. for you. Hopefully we will have won the lottery by then. We so will, have maybe. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen. Did you have any questions or anything you wanna answer? Okay. Um, so th I, that, in addition to, we've just continued to receive, um, you know, feedback and emails from people in the community, particularly around the superintendent search, and as you heard tonight, around the um, the special education needs. So that's the only communications that we've received. Um, and then the other thing that I'll share is that I was asked to give a presentation at the um, Chamber of Commerce on Tuesday, just an update about school committee, what we're doing. Um, so I shared with them that we are looking for a new superintendent and we talked about the budget. We talked about um, the athletic fields. And I feel like there was one other thing that we talked about. What else are we doing? We're doing so much. Yeah, I, I feel it's like so there was something else. It'll, it'll mm -hmm. come to me after I start talking about school. something else. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was yeah. what it was. The school. They also would like a tour of John while you're. I know they've tour. started that conversation with you, but yes. they want to. Follow up, so okay. also in the in the I'll, new I'll year. I'll see him Bob tomorrow too. So yeah, I might get it done. Exactly. So excitement is definitely building in the community. Um, so in addition to that, uh, the warrants I have approved for payment: the accounts payable warrant number 18-32, number 18-33, and number 18-34. All warrants have been included in your packet. I have approved approved for payment the payroll warrant S18012, and all warrants have been included in your packet. 
um, and then the superintendent search. So um, I just really want to thank the community, the administrative team, um, Dr. McLeod, Ms. Rothermick, for all of the time and effort that has been put into helping us search for our next superintendent. Um, we're at the process at the part of the process now where all of the interviews have been conducted, all of the public forums have been conducted, those all are available on HCAM for people who want to watch them. Um, and we are in the process of reviewing the feedback gathered in all of those different um, venues. In addition, Nancy and Mina were on the site visit team, so they visited all four districts as well. And, and um, there was a team of people who took a tremendous amount of time um, out of their regular work days to go and participate in that as well. So it's been a tremendously thorough process. Um, also, all of us have participated as well as our search firm in the reference check process. Um, so the amount of data that we have collected in order to help us make this decision is um, substantial and it is now incumbent on us to <laughs> read it <laughs> and take it and distill it and so again we will have a meeting on Monday uh, December 18th to have our actual deliberation and make a decision um, about moving forward with our next superintendent um, and I would be remiss if I did not also thank HCAM for turning themselves inside out to be in a couple of different places at the exact same time on multiple nights um, so that people in the community would have the opportunity to watch interviews and, and um, public forums if they weren't able to attend in person. So they're always such a great partner, but in particular, we've asked a lot extra of them in the last uh, couple of weeks. So I think that that wraps up everything about the superintendent search and my report. I think you're missing something. What's that? You, your contribution, oh, and just I leading know. all of it. I think you should take credit for that, Jean. Well, all the little let's wait things. Let's see how it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that. what it turns out is different, but I think all along the process, you know, you've been on top of it, and every little thing that, you know, one last minute, uh, if there is a schedule change, how it impacted everybody. I know behind the scenes you did a lot, well, and you. and you know you're being very modest. Well, thank you. It's it is absolutely the most important decision that we ever make. So it's I know we. I'll put in a lot of time and thought, and uh, I appreciate all of my partners. Um, so, moving on to new business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would just like to say that we're ahead of schedule. I was hoping you wouldn't say it. I feel like you didn't want to say it. <laughs> now we're going to talk about preschool hours I know. for 45 minutes. <laughs> that or not. <laughs> i just putting some pressure on. Okay, I'll be sure to ask my 20 questions. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So, Dr. McLeod, preschool hours. So, yes, it, it's very straightforward um, in terms of in your packet um, is a page from the agreement, page 23, article 20, teaching hours, teaching load and work year. Really, we are looking to change the preschool hours to be consistent with those of the new Marathon School, um, actually the current center school hours so that they're all on the same page. Um, this is something that does not need to be negotiated. What needs to be negotiated is if we were to change teacher mm -hmm. work hours, um, but not the actual hours that they work. And this is something that um, really is up to you um, in terms of a vote. And the reason it's on now um, is because we did want to, we are making this recommendation um, teachers know that we're making the recommendation. Preschool teachers do. They've had opportunity. Um, there doesn't seem to be concern over it. Um, I think you would have heard otherwise. And uh, we wanted to give sufficient notice to the preschool teachers for any kind of daycare changes and whatnot that they might need to make on a personal level. Um, so we wanted to have this conversation early enough in the school year. So the consideration is to change those hours, um, and the motion is before you. I have a question that I admittedly should have asked earlier in the week, but it literally just hit me. Okay. Um, because this, on the face of it, makes so much sense. Pick up and drop off. Yeah, separate entrances. So, but separate. But so we're okay. Separate entrances, but the traffic flow Correct. comes through the same place, and we're okay with that in yep, terms of because, numbers. Yeah, because yeah, because uh, yeah, I so thought we had designed it staggered, but we ha we mm, when we talked about it being staggered currently, and we talked about the, that logistically. Yeah. Then after those conversations. Um, the vote was also to provide transportation K-5. Right. Um, the anticipation is that very few children will be walking um, okay. and that very, 
since all kids are transported by bus. Um, so we have the buses that will come in and they'll queue around one side of the school mm -hmm. and then it is the same entrance but they do they do separate in order to go around a different circle for preschool. And it's not sufficient enough numbers to worry about the driveway back up, right? I don't believe so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a small, it, it was small It process, was all planned. So. It was all planned in there. Okay, perfect. Then, thank you. But great, great we'll question, because you're right. We did, we did think about the staggering of it. Um, definitely, um, I think as we've learned with our team, um, that any any glitches that we haven't anticipated we will overcome mm -hmm. um, and I think j just the planning for the, the advantages right of, of they go I know that that's not what you're questioning but um, well I think there's something to be said for building consistency I mean yeah. even to the point like you talked when you talked earlier about safety and security right there's right. only one time of day that doors are being opened for kids to come in and only one time of day that they're being open for kids to leave right. so I, I think that right. makes a lot of sense too so okay, okay. thank you thank you Okay, any other questions? And would parents, uh, do we need to inform the parents ahead of time about this too? Is that? I mean, we will, time? right? Once okay. once the vote has been taken, um, it, they, we do have three-year-olds that do return the following year, uh, but the majority of our parents are new each year. Um, and so we definitely will get this word out um, mm -hmm. to the parents so that they know. Um, the, I know what you're saying, though, the concern around, well, I'm, I'm used to them I'm used to them starting, I guess, earlier, um, mm -hmm. and now they'll be starting later because they'll be that they used to start at 8:30, and now they'd be starting at nine. Right. Um, I'm just wondering if there are parents who have kids in other schools and how you know they have planned it. Maybe just letting them know also. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Ahead of time. Uh, definitely. The, the sooner we have the information, the more we can begin to share it right. out. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Does somebody want to make a motion to change the preschool hours to 9 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. beginning in the 2018-2019 school year? May I interrupt? Are we making a vote uh, without having to check? Is that what we are saying? I yes. thought you were saying that you wanted to check with the teachers a little bit. No? Oh, no, we've no. done that. She's yep, done that. We've done that through actually through the negotiation process. Okay. Um, teachers are aware that the change is being made. I've certainly discussed it with Lauren, and um, there doesn't seem to be. I know that when we did make this change at the Elmwood School, Mina, uh, a few years ago, there was a lot of concern. We actually convened a, a, a team. Um, but that has not been the case in, in, you know, I think preschool teachers are really looking forward to being in the same building with their like-aged peers sure. and looking forward to being part of building-based meetings with the other teachers and that they've, they've just never had that. Um, and so they are on board. Okay. All right. I'll make that motion. Okay, thank you. In a second. Second. Okay, so motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Cavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstain? So that is unanimous. Okay, um, school committee policy EEA, third reading. Um, so this has been shared again by school messenger. I have received zero feedback. So um, possibly we have addressed all the concerns. I do, do want, uh, you know, I received a letter um, from the director just yesterday from the director at um, Kidsboro, um, and I just want to point out to the school committee that um, there remain procedural considerations to be worked out, definitely. Um, I think the process of taking up policy has allowed the school committee and transportation department and myself to really listen to the concerns of the community, to what the community values in terms of the partnership around daycare. And this policy addresses not only improving efficiencies within and safety within our current um, policy, but also maintains um, that which the, which the community values around daycare. There continue to be some procedural things that need to be worked out, um, but I just want to stress that that's outside the policy, and one of the things that the policy working group will stress, um, and Ms. Devlin, Dr. Devlin, uh, will <laughs> has gone through and really worked hard to help us separate, continue to separate procedure and policy within what we have. Um, I think that that, I just wanted to stress that. So I feel that this has been a really, really great example of, of some collaborative work that's taken place 
um, and that the policy that the, the clean version, um, non-marked up version that was shared at the listserv didn't have any questions, nope. I think, um, speaks to to that result. Yeah. And again, I mean, it was it was great to hear so much from the community. Um, yeah. So we will continue to app, re reach out. We'll, I already followed up with um, Christine okay. to say that we will reach out to her in the new year. Happy to have her thoughts around uh, the logistics of implementing the policy. Yeah. And I just have, you know, again, the comment that you made, Dr. McLeod, I think the policy to me looks clean. Um, and if I'm reading it right, um, we're just saying that in the afternoons, or there can only be one other stop besides your. So there can be two stops in a week. That's how I read it. Right. Within your bus. Within my bus. Your home bus. Right. Is that, a, a, and forgive me because I am on the policy. <laughs> That's okay. okay. We'll let you in still the, come. In the previous the way the policy was before we took it up, was that the case also that there were only two stops allowed, or was there mm -hmm. were there more than two stops? Allowed? Like if you yep. had your home stop plus one daycare, was there a third stop? No. Allowed? Okay, so this is the same essentially. It's, as a, it's the same. It's, it's just a reconfiguration. It's it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. The transportation department also, in response to the many discussions that we've had around this, did do mock some mock up um, um, schedules. Um, one of the questions, Mina, you had at the last meeting was around how much longer on average would a student be riding? I think the answer was, well, you've got it right there. Yep. So the, the average, um, again, this is using a test database, all right? So the average is actually four minutes. Um, so for instance, we had one bus that came in at eight minutes higher, so it now stops at 3.52 and it would be four o'clock. We have another bus that came in three minutes less. So it's 3.57 now, it would be 3.54. So keep in mind the buses that seem to have the, the higher variance, those would be ones that when we do the real and we see where kids are, we would potentially shift bus stops off of certain bus routes. So that's where we are, but the average is four minutes. What about the maximum, would you know? I'm sorry? What would maximum. be the maximum? Is eight the, the high eight? number? Yeah, I mean, eight, eight, eight or nine was probably the high. Okay. Um, so I, I still have some question on the procedural part. I feel like, you know, we had heard uh, uh, Ann Carver, Mrs. Carver, uh, speak to some of the challenges when there were like 70 requests to change things, and I wonder, through the workflow that happens within the building where the safety concerns are arising. Um, you know, if we could look at the workflow and see if we can use technology somewhere. For instance, if you had, I think, uh, you know, the one suggestion was to have some kind of a Google form yeah. where you just put in those requests and you shut down the system by, say, noon or yeah. whatever is the time that's decided. Right. And, you know, I'm just throwing ideas out here, but I feel All like right. if we can have a small group of parents and you know someone else uh, and the administrators just look at it. I I would feel more comfortable that everyone would feel included as part of the process. Yeah. Um, as to that, all of these things were looked at. And I think that goes to what you're saying that the procedural part we're still working on. Yeah. But that's part of why we really need to separate that from the policy. That's so absolutely we, fair. Yeah. So all we need to do right now is just vote on the policy, and obviously that's an important step in terms of them being able to actually finalize the rest of the procedures. Mm -hmm. So I think what's been great about this um, whole process is we've heard what the challenges are from all, you know, from the building um, staff as well as from the parents, and so you have a good handle mm -hmm. on what you need to still yeah. work out procedurally. But right now, all we have to do, if someone wants to make the motion, <laughs> is to vote <laughs> on um, <laughs> on the policy um, EEA. I know, I shouldn't have jinxed myself on policy EEA um, to adopt that as amended. So it's moved. John, second. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion by John and a second by Nancy. All in favor? Yes. yes. Okay, Oh, thank I you. did have a... No, just uh, kidding. <laughs> too late. Too late. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So, see, it was my fault. I should have never said anything. Um, You're never going to hear the end of I it. I know. Now. I know. International overnight travel requests. So we have one. <clears throat> yes, we do. Um, in your packet, you have a final request for a trip to... The Dominic 
Dominican Republic, February 18th to February 25th. I'll stress that this is a final request, so the intent came last year. Um, from Mina and Jen, who are new, you will be hearing in January both final requests for this year's trips, with, which had their, their, there were a couple that didn't have their actual dates ready yet for you, um, so I wasn't ready to recommend them. But um, you'll get those and then a, a list, and this was something that actually came from Jean, um, where they now will bring all of the requests for any international tr travel for the following year. Um, the idea being that, you know, if I'm a parent and I have a student and they want to sign up for a trip that, that they find out about and then a month later something else comes that they might have wanted to do instead had they known about it. So they all come before, I think we have a mid-February date mm -hmm. that they have to be into you. But this one was, it, through that process, was approved and really at this point it's it's just a matter it's of final blessing. Yeah, and there's there's not no changes here. Um, they're going during February vacation, as you can see. So we're looking for your final approval. Any questions? Okay, so I'm ready for a motion to approve the request for international overnight travel um, to the Dominican Republic from February 18th, 2018, to February 25th, 2018. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay, so that was a motion by Ms. Devlin, a second by Ms. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay, so that's unanimous. Public we, comments really going to put us behind. What's that? Public comments really going to put us behind. I know, it's going to put a dent in our schedule. Um, yes, we've oh, arrived well, at our second our opportunity for public comment, and we have no members of oh. the public left to comment. So I assume we're going to skip right past that, and we are on to... Items by consensus. Does anybody want to pull anything out for a separate discussion? Okay. So the superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So I need a motion so and a second. Second. Okay. So a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Okay. So we are ready to adjourn at 9.31. I just need a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. I was going to stall. <laughs> <laughs> a motion by Ms. Devlin, a second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. So thank you very much. Our next meeting is Monday, December 18th at 6 p.m. at the high school and the library. Um, and following that, we will wish everyone a happy holiday break. So thank you very much to HCAM, and we will see you on Monday. Thank you.